It is live now. Everyone, Kevin Connors, we are here. And uh, we're going to be talking tonight about BMX parts and production with Kevin Connors from Haro BMX. You are the product manager at Haro. And I thought to start this out, maybe we could get the uh, the who's Kevin Connors, just so people who may not have heard of you or know of you could learn. Absolutely. So I started out, I grew up in Baltimore and then moved to Vegas when I was 18 and started managing a chain of bike shops. And then from there, I went on to work for Haro in sales and assist some team management duties with Tony D. And then from there, I actually left to move back to the East Coast to work for Staff BMX doing marketing and running the day-to-day -day of the business. And then that turned into a good opportunity to work for Garrett Reynolds and the Fiend Dude. So I worked with Garrett to help start Fiend up until about two years ago where I returned back to Haro to do product management for BMX and which that covers BMX as far as premium and Haro goes. So I oversee all the products coming in and out except for some of the higher end uh, old school stuff in the lineage line that is uh, the brand manager John Bolgen specializes in all the old school stuff. Yeah, good dude, John. But uh, I'd say if there's anybody who's qualified to have the conversation that we're having now, it's you and product managers in BMX. So I thought that to start out, it would be good to just go into the thing that everybody talks about right now and everyone's seeing as prices are starting to rise. And that is just the in general increase in the cost of BMX parts and bikes. So from your perspective, you see it from the very beginning all the way to the very end. So, so how can we make this understandable for people who don't see that? So it's a tough one. So even like, obviously everyone knows the pandemic caused all these shortages and price increases, but even from before that, you can look at certain BMX products, anyone in the industry would agree, a a fork, a pair of cranks, uh, most handlebars. Realistically, when you're generally setting up uh, price structures in the general world of uh, wholesale retail business, you're looking at 50% you know, increase. If a bike shop buys something for $50, they want to sell it between 90 and 100. Mm -hmm. If you buy a pair of pedals for $5, you're going to want to retail them, you know, as somebody at wholesale level, you're going to want to retail them for around 14 to 15. So, but what happened with frame forks and bars is those percentages were already so darn tiny. I mean, there's literally, I've seen frames in my history, even five years ago where companies were making 28 to 30% on it. You got to realize when you're buying a frame for exit point now, you're paying a rider a percentage of that frame or a set dollar amount royalty on it on each frame. By the time that's the end of the day, when you sell those frames or that one frame, you barely made enough money to keep the lights on for that hour of the day. So they're already in BMX, was, in my eyes, quite a bit of a problem. And I would, you know, Moe or anybody would likely tell you that those certain high end items that are more expensive, like a the frame, there's really not a lot of profit built into them. Mm -hmm. So there already was essentially a problem moving into the pandemic. Then comes the pandemic where initially everyone, including myself, is sitting there as excited as we are that all the schoolyards are shut down and we can ride without dealing with the cops and whatnot. We're also sitting there as businesses thinking, well, shit, nobody can do anything. There's no events, everything's shutting down. No one knows, there's all this uncertainty and BMX has always suffered from a lack of working capital. You know, there's no company out there that can be like, I'm gonna throw a contest, here's $80,000, $20,000. No one has that in BMX. Very few people ha are able to even get that. Um, so with everyone fighting in general for working capital and questioning COVID, everyone started scaling back orders. They started canceling orders because they didn't know what was gonna happen. They needed to make sure that whatever they bought, they were gonna sell within a set amount of window. So now you see a decrease at the factory level. So the factories initially, they're already going through shutdowns in China, Taiwan, parts of the US, 
uh, parts of Europe that do assembly, you know, all over worldwide, we're going through a shutdown. These factories are seeing this, so they start scaling back materials that are coming in, employees, the, the time they're gonna spend on your account, they might shift now to another account. So you're seeing this scale back that started with DMX, and then what happened all of a sudden was, it was quite the opposite, right? Everyone was told you either stay inside or you go to your public park and stay away from everybody. So everybody went outside and bought everything. Mm -hmm. I started at Haro right when the pandemic started. At one point, my job was on hold for close to a month where they weren't sure if they were gonna hire me or what was gonna go on because of the pandemic. But then, so I started Haro, all of a sudden, it just goes eight shit. The world's buying bikes. Haro's warehouse on an average, on an average, I couldn't tell you an average number. Haro's warehouse when it's maxed out, holds about 18,000 bikes. Keep in mind, that's not just BMX bikes, that's mountain bikes, they yeah. own a road brand, they own a beach cruiser lifestyle brand, they do electric bikes, you know, the whole nine yards. But when I started out in Harlem, we're probably two to three months into the pandemic, I walk in there and that warehouse is empty. Wow. So if Haro's warehouse is empty, you gotta realize Haro's not Trek, we're not specialized, we're not the, you know, in the grand scheme of bicycle companies, in a, in a BMXer's eyes, people might think Haro's big, right? Yeah. Might, GT's big. But in the grand scheme of it, of it, GT BMX or Haro BMX, even though they're bigger in BMX, they're actually a really small brand for most vendors. So then what happened was, essentially already there's a material shortage going on because you've got trek specialized uh all the huge tire companies buying up rubber raw materials they're starting to demand factories that are able to produce bikes to open up capacity you know based on their cash flow so then you've got all these companies in bmx that are in the grand scheme of the bike industry they're the lower 50 percent and down i would say in bmx arguably maybe yeah. 40% and down if we need to be honest with ourselves. So you've got this small 40% yelling and screaming, hey, we need bikes too, we need bikes too, we need bikes too. That's not the way business works, unfortunately. Yeah. And at that point, BMX had already scaled back orders while Giant Trek specialized. In some cases, uh, the stupid fitness bikes that people rode at home, Peloton bikes. If you weren't able to buy a pivotal seat or if you wonder why ROs and all other brands don't have pivotal seats, it's because Peloton puts such a huge demand in at the world's largest seat manufacturer that they created a three day, three year delay for pivotal seats. Because to the owner of that seat manufacturer, as nice of a person as they are, they don't, they're doing business. If they right. can take an order now for 100,000 Peloton seats, they're gonna do it now rather than waiting for 40,000 BMX seats. Yep, and there's only one company that makes Pivotal BMX seats. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> and luckily that's all fixed now or somewhat fixed for the time being. But anyway, so what you have is the capacity disappeared for BMX. We're all fighting for it. Even at Haro, we fought for it. Like I literally, voices get raised in these meeting rooms where you're like, I bought X amount of bikes and you won't do this. You know, trying to get capacity, trying to lock down material, trying to lock down product. Meanwhile, the whole industry is paying more for raw material. I think steel as of last week was up just in last, the last year, not two years, over 140%. So that's essentially, you know, something that cost us $50, it's 150 plus now. That's wow. really very raw material. So you're starting at that point, you know, a year into COVID, you're starting to see all these crazy price increases and everybody in BMX, myself included, is going like, man, I don't know if the market can bear this. Like, I don't know, what do we even do? What, what do we do here? And then, you know, so you're fighting for capacity, raw materials are going up, but as raw materials are going up, COVID's still waving in and out. So the factory, you know, we'll use Malaysia, for instance. Haro doesn't use Malaysia, but Shimano makes disc brakes there. That doesn't affect BMX, but in general, it's a good example. Yeah. They shut down, I think, four different times within a year for 60 days at a time. Imagine what that did to all the people trying to make mountain bikes. Mm -hmm. A lot of similar stuff happened in BMX, whether it was seats, pedals, uh, handlebars, you know, different vendors that are popular and got backed up and dealt with influxes of uh, 
to have to close their business because of COVID. So anyway, we've got this, this problem with capacity compiled with the problem of raw materials. So now it's already in the factory's best interest to raise prices because you need them. If they tell me, if I got an email one morning that said the cost of the Haro downtown is now going up 2%, in that case scenario during COVID, all I really could say is, okay, yeah. all right, that's nothing, what's 2%? I can't argue it. So then you go, the, the, the other scenario that happened and happened real fast and it affected everything that you know we purchase as humans is container prices went up. What used to be, you know, I remember it, I remember seeing container prices five years ago at 5,000. I remember seeing them three, four years ago at 8,000 to 10,000 tops. I remember seeing them six months ago. I definitely saw an invoice that somebody paid outside of Haro that was $26,000 for a container. Jeez. So do the math, the simple math on $26,000 divided by say 500 bucks. Right there you're dealing with a massive increase and there's no way to argue it. You know, the the Targets, the Sam Clubs, the Walmarts, they all re- import enough goods that some of them, Walmart owns container ships. They own mm. containers. Other companies, uh, the mass market bikes, so uh, Hyper, brands like that, Yeah, they're done through Walmart. So they're on Walmart's contract. Um. So while Haro's paying 20,000 for a container, they're paying 9,000. Just a right. thousand more than they were paying during non-pandemic. And on top of that, these containers, they sit, you know, normally four weeks easy from Shanghai, China, from Taipei, Taiwan. You're talking four weeks out of the factory into Haro's building for sale. Now you're talking six to eight weeks. I mean, I just had a container of samples sit literally an hour off the port here in Long Beach for two and a half, three weeks, just sitting there dead in the water that I needed. Yeah. So, you know, you've got this compiled problem of the original price margin already being low, then the capacity going up, the material price going up, and then shipping containers. I mean, there was there was one time in this, you know, almost to give out too much information, this isn't what I paid, but at one point, I saw an increase on a couple bikes that Haro made where people were, a factory was trying to increase a bike 27%. At so, one time? One time. Wow. 27%. Now, arguably, there's a bit of negotiation and, you know, you fix these things and you work on them. But imagine if you're already paying one and a half times on a container, then you get hit with that. It's a tough pill to swallow, you know? And mm-hmm. how, how do you do this? Somebody like me, I grew up, I want bikes to be obtainable. I want I want any kid to be able to get on a bike and have fun, no matter what. I want them to start out having fun on a bike. Hopefully they get into BMX and it works great. But, so for me, I don't want to raise prices to the general public ever at all. But if they're raised to me to the point where there was some bikes where I saw orders on where we barely made any money or made by the time a cost of doing business was involved, I'm sure there was money lost. And I'm sure it was lost for a lot of companies in BMX because you don't just ship the container of bikes, right? You might not need them, but you don't just ship the container of bikes. So I guess in short, the really, you know, COVID starts it, then you've got, you know, the demand being dwindled back by BMX, then we find out we need it while it's not available, the capacity at factories isn't available, and then all of a sudden all the material rises. And on top of that, some material is extremely hard to get. For instance, any steel tubing, that's chromoly seamless tubing, which all of us use for our chain stays and seat stays. If it's under 20 millimeters outside diameter, it's extremely hard to get the tubing right now in Taiwan. So a frame that used to have a nine month lead time now is over a year lead wow. time because they're just wait. There's people just waiting in line to get that tubing. They, you know, um, I went to go do, there's a premium stem that was set to be 50 millimeters wide rather than, you know, at the actual, the bore, the bar bore. So that way it was, you know, a little less slippage, whatever. Yeah. I had to go down to 49, a whopping one millimeter change, no big deal. But, just because they couldn't get the block of aluminum in the size wow. that you can see it. 
So it's either wait a year or decrease a millimeter. So, you know, I feel bad for a lot of consumers and even, you know, I was even joking around. I went to a bike shop when COVID started and somebody tried charging me $20 for an Odyssey slick cable. And of course I just walked away because I'm like, wait, this is insanity, Yeah. you know? And at the time it really was. So I do feel bad for people, but you know, we all have to realize too, it's like, I tell people at Harrow when they're like, oh, you know, uh, Person X is getting a wheelie bike. That's crazy. It's like, well, Person X just got a race because they got a wheelie bike. And, you know, Person X also rides a bike down to 7-Eleven like the rest of us do every day. So why not have fun, you know? Mm -hmm. But where I try to tell everybody is in those scenarios, and you have to remember is that all of this goes back to the riders. You know, it all goes back to the riders, to the employees. You know, even at a company like Haro, and I know there's a lot more companies that are more core, but a company like Haro, everyone that actually touches BMX is from BMX and rides BMX. You know, yeah. our, our head designer, he might not ride BMX anymore, but he was an amazing photographer for years in the 90s and 2000s, and he still will get on his BMX bike, and he started out riding BMX bike. Our sales manager, James Ayres, used to be a single A pro for years, you know? <laughs> So it's like everyone's, so you're really, when you're buying a product, you know, as much as the increased cost, people need to realize too, it is going back to BMX. Yeah. People do, they do have to, you know, I don't need BMX to help me feed my dog, but I at least have to be able to eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or have, you know, have a means of getting to work and doing the job so consumers can get the products. Right. And I, through thinking about all this stuff, I feel like I've come to a pretty simple way to bring it down to when a company makes their product they have to sell it for a certain margin to be able to stay in business and make that product so if they're if they make that product and then their costs go up then the margin isn't the margin is not changing the margin means that the price of the product goes up the same at the same percentage that they yep. their their costs go up so it's not that it's disproportional or anybody's making any more money it's that no matter how much it costs to make something you need to make this percentage margin in order for it to even make sense yeah and you know openly like you know look i mean i'll tell you right now there's some products there was a three-month period where haro got a certain amount of increases on complete bikes and didn't increase the prices. Then they did a small increase, and then there was another increase we bared for six months without changing it to the consumer or anybody else. Yeah. And I know a lot of other companies did this as well. Like a lot of my good friends in the industry told me, they're like, it stinks. Like, we're just gonna hold on until we physically have to do the increase. Because we don't, nobody wants to do it. Everyone hopes the prices go back down. But I right. think it's time to realize the prices aren't going back down. Right, and, and BMX parts have not changed in price. Like before 2020, I did a comparison to yeah. 2020 to 2007, and there were certain parts, the exact same part made by the exact same company where the price was within 5 or $10 of what it was 13 years before. So it's like BMX has held on for as long as it probably possibly could have. Yeah, you know, you're right. Look at the look at the cost of the frame, right? Like a frame's a good one to look at. You know, we can't really compare a stem because arguably, you know, Moeller designed the right stem when he made the Challenger and the Redneck and we don't yeah. have, you know, it's like we can't redraw perfection. So, you know, stems and certain items aside, but look at a frame. Everybody with the invest cash bottom bracket uh, yokes, invest cash dropouts, those things invest class dropouts aren't cheap to get made yeah so you're adding to the quality to the look of the product but you're not making more money mm -hmm. so it, you know it's kind of a backwards system and it's 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 ironic because you know some of this you know not to compare to skate but i know they didn't raise prices even as much as they should have either but a skate deck did raise it yeah used to be 50 bucks with grip now it's 65 with grip or whatnot it did raise a little whereas in bmx it's just now if you if you look at it now and you pay attention to the people that just came out with frames in the last six months you'll see a few of them start coming up in price yep and they should yep. you know arguably 
I hate to say this, but I hope a frame reaches a higher value point. You know, it's it's kind of, I would much rather, you know, take Dennis Anderson, for instance. I would much rather pay him twice as much as I'm paying now and make better points on that frame and be able to fly him to more skate parks to meet more kids, to do more video parts. Yeah. That's better, you know? So I think some of this is BMX as an industry, you know, at times can be a little bit of a pissing match where everyone kind of follows suits. Mm-hmm. But I think it's kind of would be a better way if BMX as an industry was a little bit more like, hey guys, we know uh, none of us are making money on cranks, sandlebars, or forks, or frames. Let's all just agree we're just going to. Honestly, I think the frame, frame prices need to go up. You know, I yeah. guess that's what I'm saying. I wish everyone would collectively admit that certain items we don't make a lot on. You know? Yeah. And I think. Go ahead. The argument there from the consumer is an extremely real one. I, I get it because you don't want to ever price somebody out of your sport. Right. So there's tons of brands that do things not to price themselves out of a sport for an entry level rider. You can look at uh, Kink with Mission Parts, right. Ronnie Bonner with Rant, Haro has Baseline, I believe um, Merritt has a company called Theory now that does mm-hmm. some aftermarket parts. There's a lot of quote unquote catalog items like those brands where arguably they, the design already exists or it's an existing design modified, but they're still good parts. Yeah. You know, they're not bad parts. Haro's baseline frame, I'm not super hard on frames, but I rode one for nine months with not a single problem wow. to make sure that it was fine. Now, so you're going to argue that for me, a kid can buy an OEM bike, and then if they have a problem, they buy one of those parts. And then if they've been in it for a year or two, then you go ahead and you buy the, you know, the high end free coaster rear wheels or the profile cassettes or, you know, the high end aftermarket parts. So it's, I think as much as the prices have raised, the industry has been smart in being aware that they should also offer a price, a price specific item that a rider can buy into and know that it's just quality. It might not be the most innovative design, but it's quality, it's gonna hold up and you're not gonna get hurt riding it. And that's important as well. Yeah, I think you brought up a really good point with the the rants, the baseline, the uh all of those companies in bmx but i think what we've been missing for so long is the the line of communication between the companies and the masses of bmx to understand that these parts are what they are and what they're meant to be i think that there's a lot of people who might not understand that the rant part isn't meant to be on the same level as the, the you know the the premium ck or the haro exactly. like it's not meant to be even though rant doesn't make frames but it still yeah. stands it's not meant to be the same thing and i think that if that message gets put out there like yes these are catalog parts but that's what they have to be to make it affordable and then when you're buying the aftermarket or the signature part of this rider, it's that's when you're buying the thing that was made to their spec with their design and specifically for them. You know, and it's it's ironic too because I look at it too like when I built up that frame, I was like kind of laughing because I'm like, this is so much better than other frames I rode when I was a kid that I yeah. made a hundred dollars more for than this i'm like so in a way as much as cost has gone up it's gone down as well if you think about it because you know when i worked at harlan sales before i think uh you know which that was i would have been that would have been 19 years ago so i think the average cost of the frame 19 years ago probably would have been around two, 280 300. Well, yeah the baseline, the baseline frame or these these budget point price frame frames are really almost the same quality with the exception of a standard or an s and m right they really we're very close to the same quality they're better quality they have internal headsets and mid bottom brackets you know we're not blowing out bearings left and right anymore yeah you know? so it's it's a weird opinion to wrap your finger around that you know I get it from a consumer standpoint from an outsider it, it does appear that it's the gas the gas pump just gouging you for money but it really isn't you know and and nobody nobody in bmx is getting rich you know anybody that thinks that you know is is uh 
you know, there's not even pro, you know, there's very few pros out there that are living the way pros were living 20 years ago. So, you know, we need to understand that, that it's not a, we're not selling sports cars. We're not selling $10,000 mountain bikes. You know, there's a ceiling for a BMX bike. Right. That, that's a thing too. Uh, and I think that hopefully that's enough to understand like why prices have increased. I mean, it costs more for the company to make the thing. So they have to sell it for more to continue making the thing. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, if, you know, I would, you know, obviously I can't do it, but if I showed somebody what we were paying for at Haro for bike X, when I started two years ago for what we're paying for now and showed that, yeah, it doesn't have a pivotal seat. So technically the specs change, that would be eye opening to people, you know, right. to really realize that, you know, the prices, they've gone up 20%, you know, at least on bikes, on parts, in some cases, a lot more, you know, uh, you and me were bullshitting before this about the cost of molds like yeah you know i told you a, a grip mold can be up to fifteen thousand dollars now you yeah know, that's insane i mean you know everyone at the end of the day you know you take you're never going to make your fifteen thousand dollar off off your first grip so you have to be able to make that back over three years in hopes that the grip lasts five years so the last two years you're making enough money to pay back what you already paid that rider for the royalties what you paid the employee to stick it in a box the whole nine yards you know it's yep. it's not easy math to play with right and i think we're starting to get into the other conversation i wanted to have and just going through the process of like what it actually takes to take a part from being an idea that somebody comes up with to being the thing that's in the packaging that you can go into a bike shop and buy because i think that just having that conversation alone for the people who listen to all of it will help them to understand why things cost what they do and how how a frame does make sense that it could cost more money and how there's certain other parts that it's like it's crazy that they don't cost way more money just because of the amount of hands that have to go into making them yeah so i mean you know, any, I mean, I guess this really goes for any part, and some are more complicated, so we'll just, we'll use something like a pedal, for instance. You know, it's arguably a little bit more of a complicated part, but any part that involves plastic, uh, any forged non-CNC piece of metal, uh, any rubber, is all gonna involve a mold. So anyway, mm -hmm. you've got your start point for when you're daydreaming on the way to your work or whatever, and you think of a product, or you're out riding, and you notice, oh, you know what, my rent that rides this stem I made is having this problem. I need to redesign it. Never, whatever, it, whatever it is that you redesign, it, you've got your initial drawing. Yep. You know, you start out. All of us, no matter who you are, you know, there's that. Uh, I don't even know who said it, but there's that old saying that anything good starts on a bar napkin. So <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, you know, it's just to the point that any idea that you have starts at a very simple three point. For me, generally, it's my notepad. I just mm -hmm. start there. If it starts looking good. Then I have to spend, you know, on a pedal, it might be four or five days, a solid week of drawing one pedal. Sometimes I determine I don't like it. Yeah. You know? So then you're drawing it to scale on a flat dimension. From there, you've got to put it, you've got to get into AutoCAD. If you don't do, lots of people and some companies will rely on uh, China or Taiwan or vendors in the US to do their CAD work. But realistically, you, to get it right, you really got to do your CAD work yourself. Yeah. So then you're talking about a whole nother level with your CAD work. And then you're talking about a functionality level where at some point you might need that product in SolidWorks in some form of a 3D program. All my pedals, stems, stuff like that, I have to do in SolidWorks. I need to make sure that a stem fits with every brand's compression cap. A pedal is not going to rub any weird crank angles that might be out there, mm -hmm. anything like that. So from there, you've already, on any product, you already, if you're not doing any other work, just to get that solid works and everything ready to start communicating with the factory so they don't take what you think you're designing and redesign it into a complete mess for you, you've probably got a month at least. So then you send that all to the factory and they do a bunch of their typing and whatever they do and look at how much it's gonna cost the material, the time frame. Then you're gonna have, you know, in the instance of a pedal, Lots of times I'll do an injection, you know, a uh, rapid prototype, of plastic, yeah. a plastic version of it. I'll 3D print it real quick to make sure 
I'll stand on it, see if the concave feels right. Right. Nine yards. From there, you'll do, or what I will do, is I'll do a CNC version. So mm -hmm. it's actually, even if it's gonna be plastic, I'll make it out of metal. Because I need to feel how it really actually rides. That's, I think that's the big difference, and a lot of people, a lot of BMX companies do do it, where they care and they wanna actually ride it and make sure it's right. Yeah. And that's important, so that's, that's a whole nother, you know, Thing. I've got a pedal right now, a race pedal I'm designing that I've been riding for a few months on a few different bikes just to make sure the bearing design stands up in it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so then by the time you hear back from the factory, they've given you a quote of what it's going to cost and told you your pedal is going to cost fifteen to $20,000 in mold. It's going to take uh, 120 days, you know, 90 to 120 days to even get the tooling done you know, to make the mold, then you gotta wait for them to have the time to make the pedal. Yeah. So, you know, from start until sample time, it used to be sometimes you could get a sample. I mean, I remember sending stem drawings off and getting them in 60 days, just cranking stuff out. Yeah. That's not the case. Now you're talking 120, 160 days, just on a simple CNC stem sample. After you've already signed off on the drawings, talked to them about any issues, you you know, stress worked it as much as you can. And then on top of that, then you've got to have a rider ride it, you know, yeah. ride it. But I make sure all of our actual pros ride the product. Right. You know, it's that's why they are there. <laughs> yeah. If Chad was riding a frame, we didn't make it X Games for a reason. He's riding a sample frame that's not going to come out for a year. Yeah. You know, it's, it's part of it. Um, yep. So, you know, start to finish, you've got all this work involved. And for a lot of companies, you know, they've got to have uh, somebody that CAD draws it, somebody that puts it in solid work. You've got all of this price build up from yep. the initial person that thought of it. Some companies are lucky enough to have people that, you know, can do the CAD work and whatnot and it helps save on time and cost. But at the end of the day, you've got an absurd amount of time and effort and money built up into this sample. Yeah, just to get the sample. We're not even talking about making it. Or yeah. we haven't even got to talking about design of packaging and getting pa like there's so and much more to this just, just to even get it in just to even get this sample in the rider's hand and then you're just finger crossed you're yeah just sitting there finger crossed that it's, the rider loves this product and especially no, there's if, no problems at all because you don't want to be the company that comes out with something that's failing right away especially if it's got a mold involved because exactly. you do not want to have to modify that mold exactly and that's the, yeah, and that's the whole thing. Cause then, you know, you go with modifying and sometimes you can't, you know, <laughs> it's just, well, well, you're screwed. Well, Make a new mold to yeah, give us 20. Away. Yep. But you know, just, to, so then you've got the sample in the house. From there, um, I would say it's safe to say 95% of BMX companies deal with an agency in, in Taiwan mm -hmm. or they have a office in Taiwan that acts as an agent for them that talks between them and the factory to negotiate Final pricing, the amount of time it's going to take to make the good, which is going to be your lead time, and then the you know when you plan on shipping that good and packaging. Yeah. So, like for me, once I have a product, I'm like, okay, this sample is is good to go. It's ready to go. Rider X rode this. They didn't break it. I'm looking at it. There's no stress fractures. You know, we put it on a machine and tested it. There's no issues. You know, because you also have to add that into a lot of people don't realize it. You know, I guess almost circling back around but there's different iso testing that mm. legally you have to do on certain products and on a complete bike there's iso and cpsc testing oh. the amount of money i pay annually at haro to cpsc test a bike is more than i make a year so wow <laughs> think about that and if i don't do that and anything were to happen all the way down to one time i had a seat rejected when I was working at Fiend and we were laughing about it because we didn't, this is when it, we first started working on stuff over there. The seat didn't pass because if a kid ate enough of the material the seat was made out of, there was a dye in there and it could harm a kid. So it was wow. down to the fact that a kid might literally eat a seat. So we had to make all new seats. So anyway, you hmm. run into those scenarios too where you're paying out the ass for testing, you know, and again, it's time, time time's money. So. Anyway, you've got the product, it's ready to go, you've tested it, you know it works. From there, you, you've got your final price, you know what you paid for your mold. I spread, most companies will spread their molds out over time. You yeah. have, you're never 
you're not going to make something and pay for your mold on the first run. We don't. BMX doesn't consume enough grips, enough pedals to do that with. Yeah. So you've got your mold fee. You've got that. So you're sitting there looking at a piece of paper, and you got to look at your percentage points. How much is this item cost? How much can the market? What is what is currently out on the market that needs to compete with? What should it cost? What would I like it to cost? And then what is what is the break even point? You know, so any company will have a point where they deem a product. You know, we're only going to make three percentage points on this product. That's not going to pay anybody. That's going to cost us money. It's not worth it. Yep. You know, so then you have all that. So you go ahead. You start. You know, entering it in the system. While you're entering the system, you've got to pay your graphic designer or your industrial designer to sit there and draw the box. Yep. Unless you're lucky enough to have somebody that draws packaging, that also does product stuff. So you're paying somebody to draw the box, do the artwork. Sometimes just even doing the artwork, you know, I've never been cheap on artwork. There's, we use people inside, I use people out, outside of Haro. I use a guy outside of Haro that does artwork for the Olympics. You wow. Know? So. You, you can't skimp on these things. You gotta pay what they're worth. So I gotta pay him, I gotta pay person X what they're worth. So this all increases the cost of the good, but I bet you'd be pretty mad if you bought a, a $200 fork and it came in a bag that had rust or, or mildew at the bottom of it. You yeah. Know, you wanna feel like the product's at least deemed worthy of a decent set of packaging restrictions, mm-hmm. you know? So anyway, so then you put You've got all everything on order. You work with your agent to put the order in. You're checking with the factory, making sure the lead time's right. You know, then you're you're also paying somebody to do quality control, especially right now during COVID. I can't go over there. Yeah, I, I would love to. I'd rather do my own quality control. So I had to pay somebody to literally check every part hand by hand for any little scratch, anything yeah. to make sure when it gets to me, I didn't just waste my $20,000 of a container on damaged product. So, you know, you gotta realize too, in the, in the whole lead time issue, you've got, now lead times have gone back down a yeah. little bit, but as much as lead times are back down and capacity is back down, now we're back to the material issue. You still can't get the right block of aluminum for your stem, or yeah. enough of the rubber for your new tire. So say you're, Say your lead time, they might say, oh, well, we've got capacity. We can make it now. It's like, well, when can you physically deliver it? You might all of a sudden decide this is six months to a year. Mm-hmm. You know, that frame Chad was riding at um, X Games, that frame's been sitting in my office for four months, and it won't come out for another 10 months. You wow. know, it's a 14 to 16 month lead time, and it's not the factory owner's fault, not my fault, certainly not Chad's fault. It's just there's not enough material. There's a shortage right now, and you know you add the lovely whatever we got going on in Ukraine mess to this, and then all of a sudden you add another you know material shortage at times as well. Yeah, so, it's crazy. You know, it's it's a lot of work. You you want to think like I remember being a kid like drawing products and thinking like why wouldn't they do this like a Dicom Tech 77 level like. We always wondered, why is the bolt not on the top? Why do I keep destroying my thumb on this bolt? Oh, yeah. Well, because he's got $15,000 into that mold. So is it worth changing right away? Arguably, he should have because other people did it and did a great job at redesigning it. But, you know, that's why some of those things, you know, you wonder why certain things don't change. It's because the money's not there to change them at all times. Yeah, man, there's so many aspects to this. And then after everything you said, throw a pandemic in it and then the material shortage into it and that initial thing that you thought you were going to make and how much it was going to cost to do it all, how boom, instantly it just goes up how much because your container, for example, goes from 9,000 to over 20 something thousand. That's instantly like you were saying with like 500 bikes, that's instantly a certain amount tacked onto every single one. Yeah, no matter how you cut it. And you know, there's there's cases like, well, I just dealt with it now. There's there's two tires I'm working on right now. One's a wheelie bike tire, one's a, a, a tire for Chad. You would think the tire for Chad would take more samples as far as plastic molds go to get a thumbs up mm-hmm. this perfect 
then the wheelie bike tire. Nope, Chad loves the first sample, <laughs> the basis. The wheelie bike tire, I've printed 10 of these things out and I'm still not happy with it. So, oh, wow. you know, there's some things where it's like, that stupid wheelie bike tire, I've got months tied up into it. It'll repay itself in five years, but it's not gonna repay itself in a month. Wow. So, you know, it's a bit of, and that's why I always like, you know, I worked for a small brand for years and I always give them so much credit and I think oftentimes those small brands don't give themselves enough credit for what they are able to create because man it's tough to be able to get a brand to a point where they can bear the load to make a tire and know that they're not going to turn a profit for a few years or or make a grip knowing that they're giving a rider's salary out for a year just to make a grip you know things like that it's it's you know it's a tough market you know and it's one of those things it's it's a tough sport and a tough market you know it's not a you know it's it's a tricky one but i think you're right i think there needs to be more open communication with the consumers like bringing the consumers in letting them know you know hey this isn't just a cakewalk everyone wishes it was you know i mean it's it's not the day where we were making frames in our grandfather's uh, basement, you know, because <laughs> yeah. he had a TIG welder. Like, it's it's no longer those days. And I think if BMX really would have kept its original margins, even from the early 90s, it'd be a different atmosphere. I mean, frames would be 500 plus. Yeah, well, they're that now. I mean, the S&M yeah. frames, they just went up to like 540 and the Sunday, at least the the lifetime warranty frames are 520 now. So, and, and hey, props to Moeller, props to Nuno, and everyone at Odyssey for doing that. That that needed to happen, and I would, I'd be lying if I told you Chad's frame wasn't going to be just under that price point. So, it's going to happen. You know, yep. I think, I think especially with frames and forks, the consumers need to realize the high end market, the the invest cast stuff, the Sanko Japan tubing, the true temper tubing, the real sought after stuff that is needed for a professional level rider or a rider that's been riding forever the prices are going to go up but yep. there are these other brands out there there's baseline there's mission there's rant there's theory there's a bunch of other ones and salt uh exactly salt we have people at salt and salt makes great products i rode one of their hub guards for years oh yeah salt's definitely you know, one of the better ones for um, sure you know and i think everyone needs to realize too these companies you know it's we all like to support brands that are supporting riders right yep well these these smaller offshoot brands the offshoot brand might not support riders but the big brand that's making that does yeah what they're doing is they're making sure that you can keep riding your bike you can get better at riding and progress and have more fun at bmx because your bike's not breaking in hopes that if you bought i hope that a kid buys a baseline frame and in two years just rides the piss out of it and comes back and buys a dentist frame. Right. And I'm sure Ronnie hopes a customer buys a rant seat, breaks it in half and buys a shadow one. You know, it's just, it's what what needs to happen. It's a level of progression. And I think that's kind of one of the better things that's happened in the BMX side of the industry for years is, you know, I hate to compare it to Road, Mountain, all these other brands. There's all tiers of product, right? Like I yeah. can go and Amazon right now and buy plastic pedals that look the same as a hundred dollar pair of mountain bike pedals, but they're not. Yeah. I'm gonna ride real good as I'm learning, but not when I get better. And I think, you know, people need to realize that with BMX. You don't always need to go from buying a three hundred and fifty dollar complete to buying a four hundred dollar frame. Right. Yeah, and uh it doesn't matter what you're talking about if it's a hobby or if it's something that people do there is a range from the cheapest of the cheap that you can get all the way up to the most high-end level that is even possible doesn't matter what it is exactly i'm a i'm sure a lot of people know a professional photographer yeah i didn't go right out and buy a six thousand dollar camera body i shot you know eight hundred dollar to a thousand dollar camera bodies for years until it was like okay i now i need this using I, you know fifty dollar fifty dollar lens from the lens. yeah like this is super cheap lens from the freaking 70s but it works that yeah it gives you the same image you might have to manually focus it but it gets you the same image as that five hundred dollar 
autofocus lens that they make yeah. now. It's it's a similar concept. Um, so I, I mean, I do think it's important that people remember that, you know, they think about that as well, that there is things in the industry that, you know, the industry is doing to give back. And, you know, BMX in general gives back a lot. Yeah. You know, whether it's in the form of paying athletes, putting on events, like look at Trey's Swamp Fest that we were talking about before. It might not be for everybody, but it, he welcomes everybody to it. He doesn't yep. need to do it. No, and he could give it up any day. You, may, I, you know, I've listened to some of the podcasts and laughed about it. Cause it's like at the end of the day, I'd be amazed if he made a steak dinner off of it. So, you know, it's one of those things where sometimes people need to take a step back and look at things from a slightly different perspective. You know, when you're buying that that rider's signature frame, it's going to pay other riders. Right, and you dude. Know, it's going to pay other employees. It's going to pay other people. It's not, the BMX company is not looking to be like, oh, I hope I make this factory tons of money. No, I want... I want all my riders to get a raise every year. That's yeah. Wonderful. Every year. You don't think I want to give Dennis, Chad, or when I was at Fiend, I didn't want to make Fiend more money. So Garrett and Colin and Ty all had more money to have fun. Yeah. And give their life better. That's the whole goal, right? Is that you start this small thing and it goes like this. So, you, so everybody grows with it. And as everybody grows, the hopes are that this – the lifestyle around it grows, you know, so collectively it's a bigger picture. Yep, and I think that if people alone knew how much royalties were on like a signature frame, they'd yeah. be like, oh, I'd pay $50 more if it went straight to the rider immediately. Yeah, if anybody wants to do that, let me know. I'll start putting barcodes on all the Haro <laughs> products for uh, Binmo accounts. Listen, well, no, that's a sweet that's idea. That's a good idea. But it is sad, man. It, you know, I mean, look, because the real honest truth about it is there's certain companies that sell a piss load of frames, and that's amazing. Yeah. And there's certain companies that don't sell a lot. Auto doesn't sell a ton of frames. Yeah. You know, and that's fine. We don't, we don't need to, you know. We don't, you know, let other companies do it, and I get it. But at the end of the day, like you said, I mean, I'll never talk about a rider's salary, you know, dollar amounts or royalty amounts, but if they knew that some of those products don't pay for a can of beer at the end of the day it's pretty eye-opening and it's not because the employee's taking money or the guy packing the box is making too much money you know it's that they're all existing they all yeah. have to get paid it's exactly. not <laughs> normally the guy packing the box is making minimum wage and is just thankful that he can pay you know that he gets a discount on bike parts or he got a free scratch frame that couldn't be resold or something you yeah know? so it's it's it is a tough one, right? You know, it's... It really is, but things are going up, so hopefully that helps somewhat. Um, there was a couple other things I wanted to talk about because I've been saying for quite a few years now that there's a chart that w you could draw up where there's going to be an X that crosses where it becomes worth it to start making things in the U.S. for companies. Yeah. If it It's going to come to a point like... And maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't reach that point. Maybe production costs end up going back down or they go to, you know, India or Mexico or whatever and where things aren't as crazy as Taiwan yet. But there's going to come a day potentially where that it becomes it makes Mexico, sense. Mexico is more expensive. By the oh, way. it is. <laughs> OK, India. Sorry. I looked in depth, but I've looked briefly on my and actually shocking. But yeah, I mean, like you said, I think. You know, look, even Haro, you know, even Haro is owned by a, a family that owns some other things. They're all riders, mm -hmm. you know, our owner, my direct, my, my boss, she rides, you know, she, <laughs> I, I bet you it's morning time now in Taiwan. She's probably out for a ride right now. That's cool. not BMX, but she rides a bike. And that's what matters to me at the end of the day is that people involved in the company, they get on a bike and it makes you smile. I don't yeah. care if beach cruiser or what, as long as the bike's making you smile, we can be friends. But anyway, like you said, even she, even everybody has looked at the possibility of making it in the USA. I just had a Haro added uh, Pierre, the little girl that yeah. the car. So we added Pierre. The first thing I wanted to do, make the frame in the USA. Mm -hmm. I did up three people, four people. Everyone knows these people that make these frames. Yeah. They don't have the time or the cost is so godly high. Not anything against them. I want to pay what the cost is. 
but it's so high that I couldn't rightfully make a USA made 18 inch frame and sell it to those parents' kids and hope that kids that want a higher end bike are gonna be able to afford this, you know? Right. So you run into those problems and then you run into a lot of, I, I, would, I almost like I laugh, you run into ignorant American logistics problems, right? We're not there than we want. Yeah. We like to think that we are and sometimes the rest of the world associates BMX with, oh, California. It's If you take the US compared to every other market, every other market's just as big. So making something in the U.S. might not solve your logistics problem because then you're talking about shipping something out of the U.S. Oh, yeah. With that, but you're paying more and importing to other places, there can be higher tariffs. So you're dealing with, you also have to play, you know, uh, tariff games, you know, where some, some countries, uh, Europe, for instance, can't take products out of China. Um, they have to take it out of Taiwan. You're dealing with all these logistical and tariff issues and you know that making in the u.s makes it hard the cost of labor obviously makes it hard Mm -hmm. you know that's another one you know to kind of debunk it some your average factory worker that's putting stickers on a bike you might hear the rumors of what they're getting paid those dollar amounts are probably right but when you compare it at the cost of living it's more like just under minimum wage or at minimum wage Hmm. you know so there is, uh, I've never seen a factory over there that's slave labor. I might have seen a dog run through a factory, but <laughs> I, my dog's in my office every day. So yeah. It's not the end of the world. But, you know, when you look at the logistics of doing it in the U.S., I would say Mueller props to him. He's one of the few people that have really figured out the right way to make U.S. stuff. And I would sure, you know, you listen to his Ride BMX podcast where he talks about how lucky he got about buying the old Elf Machine Shop stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm sure if you ask him the direct question, Chris, if you didn't buy that Elf stuff, you'd think this would have been possible. He might have told you, might tell you no, because the cost of the machinery alone is so high, and then the cost of the guy, the cost of the guy to run the CMC machine is more than you're going to pay your top rider. Right. Exactly. It's a bit silly. I, all those people deserve the paycheck they make. But the price to make the stuff in the U.S. is very hard. Getting the mater- raw materials in the U.S. is extremely hard. Try getting um, a tire made in the U.S. for a tube. Try getting reflectors, anything like that. I mean, you can search on YouTube when you're done this. Search uh, Henry Ford uh, rubber plant. He tried making a rubber plant in the Amazon uh, year way back in the 30s, and it failed. He found out that the rubber trees wouldn't grow right in the Amazon the way they do in Asia. So you're always going to have product that has to come from certain areas, right? Right, right. Or you're always going to bring in, uh, a lot of titanium comes from Russia. You're always going to bring in certain materials from certain areas. It's just the the way the world works. Yeah, and you know, if anybody's got the magic trick on how to make complete bikes, frames, products in the U.S. and make it at the same cost or a similar cost, that's not going to cause... Uh, enormous price increase, I'll do it. Well, you know, there I'm, you not, go. I'm not uh, scared to do it, and I'm not scared to admit that Haro has looked at numerous different scenarios and ways to do it. It's I, very hard, especially on a complete bike level. I think it's encouraging for people to hear the fact that Haro's even looked into it because yeah, I'd bet a most. A they, lot of companies have had to it. A lot of people probably do. I mean, it's not. And I wouldn't even say look into it. I would say it's actively still a thought at all times. Yeah. Well, it just it kind of makes sense. Um, and you do, you know, some people, and sorry not to cut you off, some okay. people do what they call CKD. It's basically your assembly factory won't assemble it. They'll just condense everything onto a pallet and ship it to you and assemble in the U.S. Okay. So you see um, Kent USA, which is owns all the mass market stuff, Hyper bikes, all that stuff. Not they don't own hyper, but they help with the assembly of it. Mm-hmm. All of that stuff. You might see a USA made sticker. That's just because they assembled it in their plant in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. None of that stuff was ever made in the USA. It wasn't even painted here. Yeah. It was put together here. You know, so it is tough, you know, it's uh it's a constant struggle and right now it's a it's a the last couple of years to say for anybody to be honest and say it there's not a lot of unrest in asia as a whole would be lying to anybody you know you're dealing with you know china heats up politically you know they don't get along with taiwan this and that you know things can be a real issue it just 
for instance, it used to be really easy to ship something from Taiwan to China or back and forth. That's skyrocketed four times now. So, Jeez. you know, getting products back and forth can be absurdly costly now as well. Wow. So to so, sum it up, if it ever reaches the point where the cost curve makes it make sense, it, it could be a thing that we see in BMX. I think you will see it. I think you will. Because, you know, BMX was, we, everybody in BMX, sorry, I'm got to plug my charger. You're good. Everybody in BMX wants to get back to BMX. Like I was saying, nobody, nobody that's in BMX right now doesn't want to get back to BMX. If you don't right. want to get back to BMX, me and everyone else that's been BMX forever will tell you to get out. Those well, you just won't make it. No exactly. one who doesn't stays as long as there's people like enough, you. There's not enough money or whatever you might want. You know, you have to really love BMX to be in it. Nobody's in it for the wrong reason. That's exactly the thing. I mean, you find out through sticking with anything for a long period of time, especially BMX is a great example of it, that nobody who's fake or doing it for the wrong reasons makes it for a long period of time. And we need to be thankful for that. You know, there's a lot of industries that let, you know, people in in and be involved in that. It's not a healthy thing because you find out these people aren't pure or the CEO is a scumbag or yeah. this or that. They're only trying to get money. It's like, no, you know, that's yep. not the way BMX is. That's, you know, the bicycle industry as a whole is not like that. This is great. Um, so the, the other thing that I, someone brought up here that I think is a really cool thing to just talk about is 3D printing. D does it look like there's a possibility of parts that production level parts that could end up being 3D printed in the yes. future? Yes. That's so sick. Um, like what? Pedals? I have to admit, I'm a bit, I'm a bit ignorant to it, right? But, yeah. So 3D printers used to be pretty expensive. Yeah. So, I never had one at my disposable until more recent. Haro does have one. It's a smaller one, and arguably, most people would say by today's standard, it's complete junk. You yeah. know, it's, it's <laughs> older. Sometimes you print something out, it's all wonky. You got to do it again. Whatever. Yeah. It works. Um, but yeah, I think we will see a day that that does happen. Um, I'm going to completely brain fart his name, but it's uh, Gerber, right? Yeah, Gerber. Zach Gerber's been yeah, posting yeah, yeah. stuff. To him, that's like that's sick that Gerber's doing that and pushing that. I haven't personally, I tried riding a pedal that was a rapid prototype once Yeah. and it didn't last. Now, granted, that was not the highest quality. There's numerous right. different qualities and people like, Gerber probably has some good insight on this actually. I should probably gain knowledge from somebody like him because I don't know all the material differences and right. I haven't gone down that path because my objective is to use it purely from a rapid prototype standpoint, being able to get that product under my feet right away right. to function. Um, but I think it's, you're going to see it work. I don't think, um, I don't know how much it's going to work for some, the longevity of some items like a pedal, right. but if the cost is so low. I haven't looked at the cost of what it would cost to print out one of Gerber's designs or what he charges for his design. But if the cost is so low that that pedal lasts you a month and another month you can print out another one, well, then that's a that's, that's a good not thing. bad. Yeah. And that's a good thing, you know. Um, but, you know, we will see it. There's, you know, you got people printing titanium right now. Wow. Uh, that's so now. crazy. I'll email you the video once I find it. There's a an X-Pro downhill racer that is making carbon fiber, titanium lug, 3D, 3D printed bicycle frames. Whoa. And it's actually, you know, I watch stuff like that because I look at guys like that, I'm like, BMX can't afford this right now. We can't afford to do this process right now yeah. at that level. But by the time we can afford it in BMX, the level is going to be so high that it might be ready for BMX. You know, imagine the yeah. day that Imagine the day you go to somebody like Moore or Harl or whoever, and it's still a custom frame. It's still made in America by Americans out of American material, but they 3D printed the head tube. So that way, so because you could technically 3D print a Chromali invest cast head tube. Wow. And then you could lug it together and put the weld bead around that and grind it down. If a company had the intellectual manpower because these people that run these machines and and play with everything it's it's not cheap you know right. a high level of uh 
<laughs> education. You know, I mean, I used to laugh that there, I knew one of one this cat guy uh, from New York, uh, from uh, New Jersey, did a lot of the fiend, initial fiend work, and it's like the price I paid him. I didn't realize until two years ago that that's half of what you, a cat guy makes. Yeah, now, you know. But uh, anyway, I do think that we will see it because what it's going to allow it to do that. That company that does the titanium downhill frames with the carbon tubing when they're lugged together, what you could do, you could go on there now and be like, I want this frame with the way that that suspension rides, but I want a 63 degree head tube rather than your stock 67 because I'm just going to run into rocks all day or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. That really interests me. As a yeah. company that's 6'4, that really interests me because. I always have to order my frames at the time of first sample so I can get a 21 and a quarter because it's not a popular size. But if there was stuff like that set up where I could literally go to somebody like Moe or somebody could go and be like, you know what, I'm a little bit taller or I'm 200 plus. I don't want a down tube that's gonna break. Can you custom make this? I know Moe does custom frames now, but if they were 3D printed, you'd be able to change angles, you'd be able to change tubing dimensions, you'd be able to change a lot of stuff real easily. Well, that changes having the material weight is immediately different there too because now you're not waiting for that specific seamless chromoly tubing you're yep. just needing the material to load the machine which you is just need raw 4130 which is pretty wild and then yeah. i mean if we get into that you could get into talking about like what happens when you heat treat the 3d printed thing like or just any of the it's metallurgy funny, actually that company heat treats their titanium which i thought was like kind of crazy because it starts as a powder form and then it's heat treated so it's kind of odd That's to see so wild. I, I yeah i don't know enough about titanium to know how much it could bear as far as that goes but it, i did not expect that part of the process because heat treatment you either do it at the right amount of time or the wrong amount of time it's either right or wrong there's no wow. middle ground with it right you know I there was a guy uh so Zach is doing everything he's doing and posting on Instagram. He did post a video on YouTube, but a couple yeah. of years ago there was a guy from Ohio uh named Johnny Lee, I think it is. Uh he's was on YouTube 3D printing BMX parts yeah. and his the finish on them, it was like a semi like it was a matte like uh what's the word? frost like transparent material that dude, it looked like a finished product when I, did you see it I, i've seen that one and it's crazy because i had and they did it without me knowing or out asking me requesting it i requested a very high-end rapid prototype of chad's new premium grip yeah after it was designed because i wanted chad to really feel it before i opened the bowl mm -hmm. they went ahead and did because it was going to come in black and smoke clear yeah makes sense for chad right yeah okay they send me a smoke clear prototype. Wow. I slide it on a handlebar, and no shits, this thing is probably only 10% harder than his actual finished product. <laughs> it's rideable. It is a, a, it's a rideable grip. And it's a grip. That's so crazy. I'm, I'm like, wow. How? I, I would bet that if you slammed on it, it would crack. Yeah. You know, but when if you were just riding down the street and you never crashed and threw it on the ground, it would, it's rideable. Yeah, that's so wild. I mean, it's wild. Slid on off a pair of handlebars, you know, with a tight tolerance. So it's it it is, it's getting there slowly. And like you said, with finishes, I have a there's a stem in a glass case in my office that when the vendor sent it to me, I was like, even weight wise, I'm like, this is not, this isn't, this isn't plastic, you know, <laughs> and it is. Yeah, it is. You should check out the videos that I'm talking about because he made a, a front hub. He made, I think he made a stem, he did a sprocket. Uh, he did all kinds of things. He lives outside of Dayton, right? No, he's up near Akron. Uh, okay. I don't know. The name sounds familiar. I'm, I'm not sure yeah. if there's another Johnny something or another. I mean, there's Johnny Delp also from Cleveland, but that's totally different. Uh, either I'll, way. I'll have to search it, because I, I got to search Gerber stuff too, but it's actually like, I'm curious to learn more about the RP stuff and the plastic printing and the material printing because, you know, it's happening. And I think the only thing that I've heard so far, as far as a mass production goes, can be time on it. Right. right. You know, time and uh, size restrictions per time. You know, I just did a, a new race seat where I printed it out in plastic. And just because of time, I cut the thing in half. I only printed yeah. it out, you know. 
Yeah. Um, so that's one thing I've heard, and having to babysit it. You know, the one at Haro is finicky. Sometimes I got to sit there and stare at it like a bowl of fish. Right, and I mean, it'd come to a point where there'd be just like a you know warehouse full of like a farm of three D printers. Yeah. But if that makes sense, I mean, if you can make if pedals end up making sense and you can make a set of pedals just the plastic part of them for the a fraction of what it costs to do it now even talking about not needing a mold i mean immediately that already takes off the the crazy tens of thousands of dollars off of doing it so that's crazy i think that's really it, it it's got to be strength and time and cost all at once but if the cost can you know it's machines printing and you don't have to watch them you know it mm -hmm. kind of turns into a scene out of fight club where you just got a bunch of machines inside of a warehouse and some you know one lonely person picking up things that are popping out of them yeah so, man and i think it'll be uh, it, the future is probably bright for 3d printing and this the stuff in the videos i was talking about i mean his stuff looks like a finished product out of this 3d printer from i mean five years ago maybe now something yeah. crazy like that and like i said i can't you know i I could. I find it hard to believe a hub would definitely stand up, but definitely not. <laughs> yeah, a pedal or a grip or a seat pan, absolutely. Like mm -hmm. I could see that in the next five to ten years happening. Oh, and you could lessen the cost of bottom brackets by three D printing the cone spacers. Yeah, that could one hundred percent be done. That would there's be. No, there's no reason now not to, you know, headset spacers. Doing plastic. Yeah, I mean they already do the plastic headset spacers. They're they're cheap. Yeah. But looked at the cost of doing plastic cones and the only reason I didn't do it is because I figured BMXers would over tighten their cranks like they generally do anyway oh you're right and then crack them so the cost of you know even though that would have been a pretty cheap mold to make those the cost of making it you know because yeah. I've seen BMXers crack plastic headset spacers before yep. but, you know, and I'm like what do you you don't need to tighten it that much and your headset's not moving anyway yeah but then uh, what Zach's doing peg sleeves hub guards Hub guards would be a make a lot of make a lot of sense. Hub guards do too. The hub guards are one of the hardest. It's like anybody that tells you plastic hub guards are easy is lying. Right Maybe here, I got one. Yep, finding the right material that doesn't break is next to impossible. And then some people just break them left and right anyway. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I never wanted to ride a plastic hub guard, but. The one that comes on all these planetary hubs yeah. now, that guard lasted me until it finally I had to, like I grinded it down like so many times, but it just kept, it never broke. Yeah. I was very yeah, they've surprised. Got the, they've got the right formula. Yeah. It does, uh, take, does take finding that formula or knowing the right person to tell you I do X, X, and X, you know? Right. I think I'm going to have to hit Zach up and get him on here. I'm sure he'd be down. Yeah, you need to. So I need to email because I'd love to gain more knowledge. That's the that's the whole thing too. You know, BMX needs to start realizing some of us are smarter than others in certain areas, and you can learn. Because I would assume Gerber rides hard. Oh yeah. I mean, he destroys shit. Yeah. At least you know. So I'm assuming if he's riding them, they don't last one session; they last a little longer. Yeah, he hit me up about trying out some of the pedals he was doing, and I'm like, I'll do it. If you'll do, if we'll, we can ride for a day to test them out and then make a video out of it and have some fun right. with it, that'd be good. Yeah. Uh, that being said, though, man, we've covered a lot of ground today. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a talker. No, I I love it. I think this is going to be very valuable information for people. We've, I think we've talked about a lot of things that might people might really not know that much about or have any like concrete information because it's good for people to know this stuff you know like you look at the record industry people don't know everything but they know enough mm -hmm. to know it's a bit of a mess or it's a bit challenging you know yeah. or artists don't always make all the money you know it's uh i think it's important that companies start showing a little face and a lot of companies are you know yeah uh, or certainly does you know you did stuff with the guys at odyssey you know but, uh, you know, I think it's important for all of us to kind of be open to people asking questions and being like, well, why does this frame cost so much? Well, you know, here's why. I mean, what's the reason? Cost you a few dollars. This kid's got to put it to, you know, this and other thing, you know? Yep.
The only one I will agree with is I hope the cost of rubber goes down because buying tubes is getting a little insane these days. Oh, yeah, man. I can remember. I used to buy tubes when I first started riding at Drug Mart for two fifty. Yep. Now they're like eight or nine bucks. When I started when I started a shop, they were a dollar ninety nine. That's twenty four years ago. It was a dollar ninety nine for any size tube. It's crazy. Two dollars with cash, no no uh two dollars cash, no tax all day. <laughs> you know? Yeah, uh the I in that comparison I did talking about uh parts and stuff that the Aiken tire was the perfect one to look at because they've been making the Aiken tire since two thousand so it was six I actually just bought one i just don't remember what i paid for it <laughs> it was uh 16.99 in 2007 then in 2020 it was uh 26.99 then now it's 36.99 for the non-folding version yep. and it's 46.99 for the folding version and as anybody um will tell you you know, working at Harlow, we're very close with Kenda. Mm-hmm. That's, they're not ripping you off. That's what it should cost. <laughs> you know, you know yeah. that's what it costs for them to realistically put that tire on the market and, you know, put it in your hands. You know, that's, it's realistic. And the cost of rubber is going up and going up. And when you're buying a, you got to remember too, when you're buying a tire, there's so much technology that's in a tire. So there's a huge difference between a $35 Odyssey non-folding tire and yeah. some $30 generic folding tire. That mm-hmm. $30 generic folding tire might fold, but it ain't going to do nothing else you want it to do. It might not even have rubber in it. Oh, and okay. That's the whole thing you start realizing. You know, you realize you look at, like, that's the nice thing about Haro having other brands is that I start realizing, like, like the other day, I'm like, I had to buy a freaking road tire. I'm like, what? This is retarded. The and type price like, of it? Yeah, and then I'm starting to look at like what all goes into it and reading about the technology because I'm curious and I'm like, oh shit, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I, I think that's one area I hope BMX progresses in. You know, now that I, you know, have more tools, you know, tire wise under my belt, you know, starting to realize BMX tires, you know, I know we wear them out fast with not having brakes, but it's like, man, there's a lot of technology there that we should be utilizing and some companies like odyssey do put into their tires which is good and you know auto wise you're going to see chad's new tire have a definitely the sidewall the bead the tread everything material wise is going to be it's not going to be cheap but it's going to be a good tire that's absolutely something that i would love to make a video about you know, and it's, <laughs> we could definitely discuss that more further sometime but you know it's like you said people are worried about the price of bmx goods i think if we can keep the quality and the price where they're at as of today or in the next 30 days, you know, like you said, frames and forks need to go up. Yeah. Then what BMX should look at doing is making products above that. Yeah. It's possible. Look at profile, right? Not everyone, you know, when I wrote a cassette, if you ask Matt Copeland, I used to buy tons of freaking hubs and axles from them, you know, titanium this, titanium that. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. That, that stuff should exist in more places than just profile or high-end park riders you know like Mm -hmm. there's technology out there for street riding that should have been used years ago you know look at the planetary hub i know you like arguably you're one of the people that really started first talking about that Mm -hmm. how had that technology for a couple years before i heard that the table i heard that in the horror with that three years before i heard anything about it they had already seen a working sample yeah. They just weren't smart enough to realize at the time they didn't have somebody in modern BMX street riding to realize like, whoa, wait a minute. Here, here's all our money. Yeah, I did right now. I don't think anybody saw it until after like my videos even came out because it was like nobody seemed interested. And then I think I think it crept into a thing of where like, oh, this is like crazy and then I think nobody talked about it because everybody realized that they needed one <laughs> yeah you know it's a weird one too because so it's like when i first heard about them like you know i know how planetary gears work in the transmission you yeah know, i'm aware of what a plan a sun and gears is i know yep. so I'm, I'm sitting there and i'm thinking I'm like how the hell did a bmxer get that functionable enough in such a small space mm-hmm. and then just went down a whole wormhole and that was probably six nine months before i started at premium and 
back at Harlan Premium. And then it was funny, I saw your video and I'm like, I already knew Granite BSD. He was, so everybody knows outside of the guys, Cal and Alan at Planetary who designed it. Yeah. Granite BSD was one of the first people to fully as a brand back support and invest it. Yep. You know, which is important. People should know that, you know. Um, Premium now makes one as well. Ours is a little slightly different than theirs because of certain things. Uh, you know, Colin Berniak brought up a good point. If you want 80 whip on one of those and do land wrong, like even some of your videos. Oh, yeah. Engage, you can. Well, if you land front foot only, it's yep, bad. Um, Colin was like riding riding the park one night and did it on a set of stairs and text me he's like fuck this thing blah 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 I'm like what if I just put a little hair of slack and then mm. he's like what can we do that and I'm like I don't let me I don't know let me figure this out you interesting know? so it's very it's almost counterintuitive to what and even when I started talking to Tao about it I think he was like what are you what I, I want no slack you know and yeah. I get that I ride I, lo I ride one with no slack, but Colin does ride one, and the premium one has just a tiniest bit of slack in it. That's you know, it's interesting. Not it's not even a quarter turn. It's probably less than an eighth of a turn. But I... it's just that if you've got a little weight there, but you do feel it. You know, when I'm pedaling with a camera bag the first time, I'm like, there, there is a little slack, just a hair. That's interesting. I would love to s just hear and, like, see that because obviously i've seen a lot of the other ones so far but to see the difference in that yeah. um are you are you right or left right all right i'll send you one <laughs> uh damn it i was gonna say something else oh uh so i mean we've talked so there's been a lot of like i wouldn't say doom and gloom but there's been a lot of like meh price talk going up and everything what does it take for things to go the other way and to oh. make sense like what is how is that even um, possible i think <clears throat> it was a tough one to before before, before so, you even like get super far into it the only reason i bring this yeah. up is because when i was talking with keith at source when i was there mm -hmm. and we were talking a little bit about inflation and raising part costs and everything these things he's like man it feels like the 80s all over again with and i'm like so this has happened before that yeah. means that prices in general have gone up but then they've come back down so and i was like How, what did, what makes them go back down does anybody even know <laughs> yeah bicycle industry wise i believe it's happened four times the only time we've seen it this crazy man it, it i've only heard about this from people in the industry far above me you know there's a guy at Haro that literally worked with GT for years. Yeah. And before that, he was in a shop, and I think he told me it was in the 60s when, man, it hit, like, it was way crazier than the COVID effect. Um, but anyway, I think for it to go back up, right now there's a problem that nobody wants to admit. Everyone in BMX got fucking COVID happy. We thought we were selling everything forever. Mm -hmm. A few people that didn't, and they're smart. So everyone put all these bikes on order, right? And all these factories had these long lead times, no capacity. So it took forever for them to, to, to get these bikes made and these factories to catch up. But what happens in, you know, the bicycle industry, say there's 300 vendors that make Bolt X, Frame X, this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. In the DMX world, we all use the same damn 20 vendors because it's such a small chunk. Right. So once those vendors caught up, everyone caught up. Okay. I was at the source one day, saw GTs roll in. I'm laughing because when I left the day before, I started getting bikes in stock. So, and then I heard Sunday got bikes in stock. Then Company X, Company X, Company X. We all got all these bikes in stock. Right now, to be honest with you, in BMX as a whole, there's almost too many complete bikes. Yeah, I could it's, see that. Sitting in warehouses. So, mm -hmm. we're going to go through this period and it won't affect all of BMX. It's going to affect the mass market or mainstream. Let's not use the term mass because we're not selling toy store bikes. Right. It's going to affect the mainstream, the mom and pop shop, the Jim's bike shop down the corner that sells sub $500 parts. You're going to see a lot of bikes having to go on sale to, to mm -hmm. lower inventory level. And right now I know like for us, we don't want to put anything on sale. Like that's insane. We need to stop putting items on sale. An item should only be on sale 
when an item is not being made anymore or it's old and retired. Yeah. The model year 21 bike is no different than the model year 22 bike half the time except for, oh, okay, now they got plastic sleeves on the pegs and yeah. a different paint job. There's usually not a huge difference. So I don't think, I'm hoping that BMX as a whole doesn't start decreasing bike prices because we all know once um, certain brands that have done historically crazy things, you know, previously, if they go off and they have too many bikes and they start putting them on sales, other brands have to. And once right. they're three doing it, we all have to and it creates a mess. But so what it needs to do past that point, so once once the inventory balances out, and it's not an inventory issue on the core market or the uh, P and A side of things in the higher ranges. It's everything business is great. But That'll continue, but I really truly think what needs to happen is there's a lot of parties right now not doing events because mm-hmm. of the COVID thing. Um, look at bands. Right, yeah. I don't think they came out and publicly said it, but they're a large publicly traded company. Yeah. They, if COVID's going on any world, they, anywhere, they can't do world class events. That's... They had to scale everything back. Those events, they show BMX to the public eyes. Yeah. You know, I deal with it like I probably, if you asked me three years ago before going back to Harlow, I'd be like, oh, fuck that. We don't need contests. Like, let's just go ride street all weekend, do have a beer midday, whatever. But now that I'm working back at Harlow, you know, you come in on uh, a Monday morning and someone's like, oh, did you see that, like, Olympic contest? Did you see this on the weekend? I'm like, what? And it's purely to non BMXers or people wanting to get into our sport, that's what they first see. Right, yeah. So, is the the bands contest the monster just started doing the triple crown events they tried during covid they tried a couple times but they just started doing those again you know mm-hmm. x so games like, just became real again exactly well, yeah to some <laughs> <laughs> That's other, you need to have 10 podcasts about, 10 years about that. But, um, so you know but once that stuff starts picking up gradually again more eyes will be back on BMX and it'll help the whole industry out a lot. And the other thing too, you know, we need to, BMX has had, and that's hard to even talk about, we've had like a lot of hardships, right? We've yeah. Got the Mira incident, incident, you've got other pro riders that would have been a Tony Hawk or somebody in a public yeah. ride that took a serious injury that had to force them to take a backseat before their time was there. Yeah. So my hope is that, you know, my hope is that the Garrett Reynolds, the Dennis Andersons, the guys that are the, at the top of their class riding wise, Dakota, people like that, that they stick to it because they're already shit. When I was first getting to BMX, a pro at Garrett's got to be, I think he's 30 now. So yeah, Garrett's, Garrett's 30. A pro riding at that level at age 30, get the, that's not fucking possible. Yeah, now, right. Now it is. Now it's it is. normal now. It's that generation, the Nathans, the Dakotas, the Garretts, the Dennises, that are pushing everything for how long it can last. My hope is that those guys never have to leave the sport. Those right. guys, I don't want Dennis to ever retire from horror. Right. He can retire as being a pro BMX rider. That, that's his business. If he doesn't want to ride competitions anymore and just wants to go have fun, that's great. But imagine a sport, or sport, I hate calling it that. Imagine <laughs> a lifestyle or an industry. Imagine BMX where these people don't retire. Yeah. Rather than a pro retiring, they're still involved. I don't know what Dennis does next. Maybe he still rides and he's just a persona at Haro that works in the office, does whatever he wants to do there. You know. Mm-hmm. But imagine they didn't have to go away. And I think about it even down to the thought of, Bob Haro. Imagine Bob Haro was still 100% sitting at a desk at Haro. Yeah. It'd be fucking amazing. The guy's an amazing guy. He's an innovator. He did a great thing for freestyle. But as he grew, the sport ended up going through a funk where there was no money. Like you mentioned in the 80s, 90s, where he had to sell his company so his company could stay alive. Yeah. If he wouldn't have done that, his company wouldn't be alive today because it would, might not have survived the slump, you know? So hopefully, you know, and stuff like Hoffman, hopefully those guys are given the proper limelight to speak more for BMX in yeah. a grandiose way, you know? Because I think skates had that, and I hate, you know, you have to compare it to skate because it is the closest thing. 
But, you know, look at Tony Hawk. Look at Andrew Reynolds. I mean, Andrew Reynolds is still putting out banging video parts, but he's not putting out stay gold year after year after year anymore. Right. But he's still involved, you know. So I think as, as social media arises, as more of the ambassador way arises, I think as pros retire or move on from that level of riding, they'll now be a place where they're still allowed to carry the torch. They're still allowed to be a BMXer in the limelight. They're just not doing, you know, they're not trucking a 21 stair anymore. Instead, they're doing it, it looks better now, and they're doing it on a 12 stair, you know. Or yeah. But they're still involved. And I think, you know, BMX didn't have a lot of longevity. In it. I mean, to my knowledge, more might have the longest acting career in BMX like Moore Robbie some of those guys Robbie's a little younger than Moore but you know Fids Fids yeah exactly Fids um, you know you know you look at those guys they've had long lasting careers and yeah. you know, look at uh, John and the guys that own Source BMX like if there's more good people in it for a longer time like they are BMX will last a longer time and it'll grow right that, that's what's been the sad truth about BMX is that it hasn't gotten to that point yet, you know? Yeah, I almost feel like we need some, like a Tony Hawk figure. Like there was right. there was Hoffman at that time and Mira was definitely like a yeah. Tony Hawk figure. But like, I mean, I, I feel like Hoffman kind of like, obviously they're different people. They wanted yeah. different things. Like obviously if Matt wanted to be like Tony Hawk, he very easily could still be like in the limelight yeah. the way that Tony is. Yeah, you know, and there's there's different things that, you know, cause that, you know, I think for in, in Matt's case, you know, my knowledge of the situation, you know, you know, injuries aren't good. Aren't yeah, good. that's you true know, too. I've spent a month in the hospital before, you know, and suffered from head injuries and it, it's not a positive thing. And I think, Matt with his contest stuff, he wanted to be more involved, but different governing bodies got up and in front of it, and they took they took what he was building, unfortunately. And you know, yeah. whatever side of the fence you fall on, on that is whatever side of the fence you fall on. But like you said, it would be nice if if even K Rob, any of those guys, could have took on more of a persona or imagined, you know. Matt had such a big thing in the X Games. Imagine Matt now was the one running X Games. It'd be a totally different thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, even like a Ryan Sheckler, like every exactly. single, you know, at a certain point in time, every 13 to 16 year old girl in the country knew yep. who Ryan Sheckler was and the amount of people and like, or bam, you know, like exactly. skating has always had so many of these giant figureheads that I feel like BMX is just like we it's like we got a ceiling for that yeah and you know some of it is right like some of it is BMX sometimes can be too cool for school oh yeah right? and 100% I've been so guilty of it and I've told friends at other brands everything I'm like don't be too cool to school like mm -hmm. I'm not scared to admit dude, my salary comes from little kids aluminum bikes yeah. no big deal I do not care I put blood into those bikes to make sure that they're the best little kids aluminum bikes I can do for the dollar. Yeah. You know, and I think that's kind of what it is sometimes. You know, Rider X or Person X might be like, I don't want to do that event at Disneyland. That's that's corny. And it's like, was Sheckler corny then? Yeah, to me he was. I was twenty one years going to the bar partying while he was doing that. Yeah. You know, take it back to last year, I'm riding his warehouse with Chad and Sheckler's petting my dog. He's <laughs> the dude ever. Like Yeah like dude you're actually a cool person it's just you were a little kid going through a whole lot of shit well, the tv setting so you appeared corny right like, you're, you're still a good human being like you're allowed to be a little bit corny and not be a bad person or you know yeah i think that was probably more of the people running the tv shows than well, any because yeah. they're like we need to make a tv show so you have to do this like but you know what i'm saying yeah you're i get it fully those people or like you know the Adam yeah. LZ is the perfect yeah, example. To say. Not to say that I was a huge fan. I definitely think it was kind of a weird situation. It was a little early for its time. But look at it. Was the kid a little corny? Yeah. But did he bring eyes to BMX? Yes. Yeah. Did he do anything negative BMX? I would argue the whole getting a paycheck as a pro rider thing. But that's also a brand responsibility thing. That's saying I'm not paying to be a brand rider. I'm paying him because I think 
He's a nice kid that's showing a lot of the, the world BMX. That's the only reason I'm paying him. Yeah. It's not because he does tricks. Or right. Anything, you know, so it's a, I think it's a balancing act at BMX. I think BMX is learning it, you know. As oh, a, yeah. As a photographer that's been on some higher paid, you know, jobs, I've been on those with riders that if they were asked to answer the questions or do what they were doing, the interview they were doing 10 years ago, they probably would not have even answered the email. Yeah. And now they're like, yeah, you know what? Okay, that does make sense. Yeah, and uh, when you bring up the whole Adam LZ and the YouTube conversation and just how BMX reacted to him, yes, there were definitely like things that happened that BMX reacted yeah. to, but I think at the same time, they reacted to the YouTube part of it in the worst way that they possibly could because oh, yeah. as we said before yeah. I started this, like people and what I love to talk about is I think that people missed a boat in the YouTube thing that if instead of ostracizing YouTube just because Adam LZ was the guy who was doing it and yep. if they would have adopted it and we realized real quick that like that team trip video that Haro did to Columbia or whatever yeah. like that team trip video could have like a props vibe to it use music <laughs> Yeah, use a music from a, a site that you pay to get royalty free music from, have the guys talking some, and that could make you your paycheck from Google. Like, that is, a, that could be amazing. And you know, it's funny too, because like I said, we've all been victim of it, right? Or not victim, we've all, we've all thought it was corny, or a lot of us have, you know, myself mm -hmm. included. Like, Colin Beardrick, I've been friends with Colin for freaking years since he was 16 a little crazy kid riding Garrett's ramps in New Jersey and when he started doing YouTube videos at first I'm like dude get out of here like I don't want to be involved in that get out of here what are you doing yeah we're picking you up to go ride a schoolyard why is your GoPro filming you get in this van what is wrong you know but then like at the same time I always not that I supported him because I didn't love being involved in him when I every once in a while when I was in the background but you know, I look back at now, I'm like, maybe I should have gave him more motivation and more like, dude, okay, not my style doing it, but it's your perspective, you're showing people your world. And you know, the thing that has to become for respect, the one thing I do respect, and I don't know Adam LZ, so maybe it's not true. I think he really was himself. Yeah. In those videos, and I respect that. It's like, I always joke with Chad, you know, Chad's got the new YouTube channel called Chad's channel. Yeah. I was telling him the other day, I was like, you already did, nobody's probably seen this and you're not going to find it online so I can talk about it but Chad did a vlog like five years ago that was him at a rock star party with a GoPro just having a fucking night that's awesome to this day I always told Chad I'm like you already did the best vlog yeah like, what are you, even gonna, you know but I think it is cool and kids need to see that you know they want to see what you're into and mm -hmm. what you're doing and that's why I say even as companies like I think we need to hide less you know like what Moeller does with the Factory Friday shit is awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. If I had a welder out there, I'd be doing the same thing. Yeah. You know? I think it's cool that he shows a little piece of it in this and that. You know, it, it's definitely, yeah. it offers a unique perspective of it and gives kids a view. It, it, it adds value to his brand. You know, people are seeing there's humans in there working. It's yep. always the shit. People are working. Yep. And in regards to the Chad YouTube thing, it's when you look at the alternative for something a kid's gonna watch like yeah. there's only so many bmx videos that a kid's gonna watch riding wise because that's what mostly has been out there in the past few years it's yeah. it's changed in the past couple years and there's a lot of other stuff too from pros that people can watch but like before that it was like all you could really see was like people riding and then what do you think they're gonna do when they're done watching the edits they're gonna turn on the the twitch gaming person who's gaming and if if you've ever went on twitch and watched any of these gamer people dude they are the biggest pieces of shit oh, they I are heard. constantly just oh, I, i've heard oh it's so bad just talking trash to the like to the people that can't even hear them that they're playing against and then i have friends who have kids now and like you hear the kids saying some of the same stuff they're saying i'm like dude this kid could be watching someone like Chad Curley playing Dennis Anderson in a game of add-on on his ramp. And that like- Is that worth an hour of my time? 
I didn't actually watch it yet. Yeah, they're two, of my, they're two of my closest friends, but I haven't had. I'm like, when do I have an hour to watch it? Well, I saw it was 43 minutes, and I was yeah, like, yeah. damn, I that's a long Andrew, game. I Andrew, who did the video, and he was like, you know, blah blah blah, and you know, take a look at it, like, you know, I was like, I don't think I have 45 minutes. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, I, will, I will watch it when I have the time. But. but there's so many other people, even adults, like people. Oh, I yeah. I found like through what I do that there's. The majority of the people who are leaving comments are people who are from the age 25 to like 50 or I'm more than 50. It's crazy. Like me and my wife will sit here at night relaxing, drinking a drink on the couch and we'll watch stupid YouTube videos about camping or like yeah. she likes to go mountain biking. So we'll look up different. There's guys out in San Diego that do mountain bike trail reviews. So we'll look at different trails that she might want to ride or, you know, different places we might want to go. And I'm like, man, this is the same crap that I gave Colin for. I mm. won't apologize for it, but <laughs> I gave him, you know, it's, it's, I'm giving, you know, I'm watching what I gave somebody else crap for. And, you know, I think we all just need to be open to that, you know, and yep. as a rider, I'll tell you, it's a good thing. Like for somebody that works at a company, I'm stoked that Chad did that. Like yeah. he did one other day where he showed up to Haro. That's you know? awesome. I'm like, yeah, it's awesome. He's like, what can I show? I'm like, this one bike, this, that's the only thing you can't show is this one bike, do whatever you want. You yeah. Know? I think that that's awesome and that's the way it should be and it, stuff like that adds value like there's certain riders out there um dakota does a really really good job at his instagram story and like you notice that yeah you know where it's like kind of a recap of the day matthias is the one where it's like how do you even have time to tell us about your whole life like that but you know it's like it's the same sort of thing it's it's, it's important for us to add human feeling and bring people in that is exactly it and i think that as long as people are being themselves uh, like i'll be honest when i started making youtube videos i didn't yeah. want to talk to the camera i'm like oh, i yeah. i just i didn't i literally tried to like vlog without talking to my camera it basically ended up just looking like a snapchat story yeah. as a, or an instagram story as like a long video but <clears throat> you realize through doing this stuff that like people have a personal connection to the yeah. person who they're watching and and if you're just being yourself like i think that's the most important part of seeing chad that's exactly that's the thing like i think as humans we're all drawn towards the people that are the rawest in the fact fact that they're who they really are yep you know no matter what scenario they are in they're going to show you who they really are they're not going to hide it you know and that's i you know BMX should hide less and, and show more and try to bring, you know, their side and the human side into it more. Look at Patagonia. Have you ever seen a Patagonia video that's about uh -uh. a jacket? It's never about a jacket. Oh, it's yeah. About somebody that wears that jacket that goes yeah. for 50 years. Yeah. So it's like, you know, we got to realize these other things. We've got a lot to learn from other places. <laughs> but what I will say, too, because I'm sure there's a bunch of people who are like, I'm cool. Fuck. And what I'll say is, yeah, you should be yourself, too, because there's a place for that. And and don't be ashamed of sh putting that out there. And yeah. no, and no one should be ashamed or talk down on somebody like unless unless you're being a dick and you're like talking down on other people and actively just being yeah. like that then okay yeah maybe we should like shame that but like there's there's plenty of room for the core side of things that way man because if you know we need that still because if there's not like if there's not those people out there that are like hey man don't film at this spot like do not share this spot that spot won't be there in a month yeah if there's people out there that don't sit to the kid next to the skate park on the copy and be like hey man you saw that he went, they went, then you went, so you wait two more times till you drop in on that mini. That kid's never gonna learn ethics. You yep. know, like I learned a lot from riding a mini ramp at a skate park in Vegas because it was like, no, there's a pecking order. Yeah. And you don't dare snake somebody older than you ever. Yeah. <laughs> and and I think I mean, just along those lines, one thing that uh, I very much so learned to pay attention to is that people don't know something until they learn it they don't just randomly yeah. just know these things unless you're a fool like you're an adult and you come into a situation very observant and you're like but even then you're learning it so like the kid at the skate park who you're talking about like who that should people should be telling like hey wait two more people wait till they both go then you can go again like 
they don't know that until somebody tells them and we should never assume anyone knows anything so like exactly what you're saying it's important that you know and you got to like you said you got to not be a dick but still have your core values out there Mm -hmm. you know i mean there's things where i'm like i'll put my foot down at work where i'm like what what did you just say like no 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 no. there's yeah no no go back over there this is the way this is done (laughs) you know and i mean you got to have those you know or else there's no structure but you're right it's it's showing it and doing it in the right way yep and and there's people should be able that's why bmx is so sick right now is that people are able to just like look at it as a spectrum and then be like i like this like that's the thing bmx really is sick right now like there's so many different riding types you know like look at that video albert just put out like did he ride so much different than other people or you do a lot of different tricks like there's so many different people doing different stuff and there's so many people doing new tricks and inventing new tricks and pushing stuff to limits that are insane. Like the, some of the photos I've shot, like, you know, I don't shoot five days a week like I used to anymore, but mm-hmm. some of them I'll look at them and just laugh. I'm like, that has not came out yet. And that trick's never been done <laughs> Booney by that, you know, but it's like, I'll laugh about it. I can't even witness, I got to, I got to see that. Yeah. Know? Yeah, it's crazy. Like those things, it's like, man, it's, you know, it's it's awesome right now. And the level that things are progressing are just, it's, every day it's something new. It's insanity. Yeah, and no matter what you're into, if you're into street yeah. riding, different, even different types of street riding, yeah. you can focus in on these specific riders. And I think that the more that we go on, the more that, like, everyone's going to get the same, like, light in bmx i would say there's definitely a heavy focus on certain aspects of bmx within like the industry and what people see media wise but the more we go the more it's just gonna keep going so that everyone has everything they get to watch and i think that you know i think that's a good thing and that's that's something that kids need to understand too it's like you don't need you know a ramp necessarily to go ride you know, mm-hmm. like I just did a shop stop, uh, shop visit with one of Haro's biggest accounts, which arguably is not, it's a mo- huge mom and pop chain bike shop. Yeah. And someone asked, well, I can't sell BMX that much because I don't have a skate park nearby. And I'm just like, I know this is in Fargo, you know, and it's cold winters, but uh, I was just riding the curb outside for an hour and had a shitload of fun. Yeah. And, you, and like I told him, I was like, you should check out these accounts. You should check out this person. Like, You'd be surprised, like, you know, let kids know you can do this. Like, oh, that is true, you know? And it's like, yep. you, gotta, you gotta explain that to people. Like, that's the sickest thing about BMX. Like, I can leave my house right now, and there's not shit to ride here for maybe two miles, but I can ride a lot of curbs. And, yep. you know, and I can ride a lot of stuff for fun in those two miles. But there's no actual things to ride for a couple miles, you know? yep my buddy sponge he just moved out to montana for work for a year and he sent me a picture yesterday of like a it was like a small six stair with like this the bottom stair was one of those bump jumpable ones and he's like foofanooing the top stair and his caption was cut bank quarter pipe because he's in cut bank montana and like he's literally riding stairs like it's a quarter pipe that reminds me of like Juan Tran how he used to just haul ass up like a 10 stair and do a turn down out of like doesn't look fun on a BMX bike but it does look good (laughs) yeah that makes no sense oh man is there anything else we should talk about oh uh, on the subject of prices going down I remember I did have a conversation with someone about this Uh, what they said is that thing it may take things getting so crazy like material shipping costs and all of this stuff for industries as a whole to just like ha- start having people obviously you're gonna have the people who are like well we can't afford that so we like we have to back off but then there's gonna be the people who are like we're not paying that and so there will become a time where the supply goes down or the demand goes down as the supply is low if demand goes down, supply is gonna start going up, and then price, in turn, because of economics, will fall. Yep. Yeah, and that, I mean, you know, that's the. I wouldn't say that's one of the last scenarios you want to see because that's showing that people are potentially leaving BMX. Yeah. To the cost of things, and that's always the trick that we play in, play in the realm of the 
extreme sports were one of the most expensive ones to really be involved in. But, yeah. Uh, no, I totally agree with that. And, you know, as the cost rises, you know, they're, they'll reach a point where a frame, I mean, it's going to reach a point where it's not obtainable. But then again, you're buying a frame that lasts you over a year. Yep. You're paying, how can somebody argue that a $400 plus, $450 plus frame, $550 frame, is a ripoff when it lasts you more than a year. There's no way to quantify it currently without thinking very hard about it. You know, and another another one too, you know, BMX gets stuck on, and uh, I think it's awesome that BMX does it because I do believe in a high level of customer service, but the idea of a lifetime warranty mm -hmm. is insane, in a bit. It, it, it's great, it's great to stand behind your products at that amount of level, but to, for me to think that someone's going to bring a, pair, a frame back five years later and want it warrantied, and I've seen it happen where I'm like, well, shit. All right, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, the chainstay might be grinded through, but he did crack the head tube a little bit, so whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, this is silly. You know, at some point, you know, you got to realize that costs companies a lot of money. Yeah. That To stamp that on their products and get that back, you know. So I think, you know, kids need to realize, all of us in general need to realize how high quality some goods are. Yeah, and just so, go ahead. I, I've seen some of the best street riders in the world because arguably, you know, that's the realm I was, I'm still in a lot and that's the realm most of my friends are in. Mm -hmm. I shot more photos in. I've seen riders there ride frames for, and the forks for well over a year. Oh yeah. I would never tell, I would never ever tell a rider to ride a fork over a year. I tell Dennis to ride it less like four months. <laughs> well, same thing, just because yeah. I, I can give them forks. They have an endless supply of forks. Right. I don't ever want a phone call about a fork or a handlebar or any issues, even though I believe in the product. But what I'm saying is I've seen riders ride things far past the level I think it's safe, and they're fine. Yep. They're totally fine. Yep. You know, so it, it, these, these things do hold up, you know, and then they give their frames, friends, their frame to person X. And then 10 years later, I just saw a kid the other day that was on a sample frame. And I know what it, it was a sample frame I designed seven years ago at the skate park riding. And I'm like, I thought it was Jeez. sick. But at the same time, I'm like, that's dangerous. If they knew what that frame really did, you know, and I'm like sitting there next to him just looking. I'm like, that still looks like it's in good shape. I'm like, you know, <laughs> but it says something about the quality that's in BMX. It's almost too good a quality. You know, you buy a, your $60 skateboard, you fucking try a trick for two hours, then you, you know, focus the board in half. It's like, you're not, you go buy a new board, you don't complain about it. By the end of the year, you pay more than $550 in debt. Yeah, I think uh, if you break it down, all you gotta do is just count up how many times you think you've ridden in, a, in the time that you've had your frame. Divide that by the cost of it, that's how much you paid per session for that thing. And I'm sure for most of us, it's like an understandable amount. Yeah. And at the end of the day, how big was your smile when you did it? Or how much, how good did it feel when you did the yeah. trick? It's like, well, shit, that's, you know, that's worth the money. Yep. I just don't think BMX has shifted its mindset that way yet. Not yet, no. And I think it slowly will as, you know, some of it too, I think, BMXers in general, we're seeing some of them open up to other areas of the industry. Mm -hmm. And I think that has a trickle down effect where it will bring some technology into BMX that can be good and it'll help open riders' eyes to, we, we don't need to bitch about the size we are now. We need to work together and wonder why we're not that size. Yeah. And that's because they all work together and build trails together. So maybe we all need to work together and save our spots. You know, work together to preserve spots, work together to build skate parks, stuff like that, rather than just assume the county should give us millions of dollars of concrete, you know? Yep, and that... Something too is, you know, you gotta, you gotta nourish the scene and grow the local scene. That's something I always tell, you know, it's a similar thing when you go to a BMX shop, a bike shop, and they're singing the woes, like, oh, you can't even have that one stem in here because it just, it'll sit for six months, and it's like, what'd you do for BMX? Yeah. Like, what did you do for BMX today? You didn't do anything? Okay, well, then you don't deserve the $10, $25 you're going to make off that stem because you didn't do anything for BMX. Oh, you gave a kid a tube that let him go ride more? You can afford it? That stem will sell for you. It's karma in BMX, a bit of it, too. You know, we got to remember to nourish it and grow it. Absolutely. On that note, for sure. I agree uh, fully. 
I had something I was going to say and I lost it. Damn it. Uh, uh, the technology note is interesting because we're starting to see carbon rims. Yeah. And, and it's just going to be interesting to see what comes in. And carbon rims are probably cost prohibitive. Not probably. They are cost prohibitive right now because yeah. they're like 300 bucks a rim. Yeah, I don't think, you know, I, I applaud EFA for doing it and somebody needed to do it. It's done in BMX race. Um, even in BMX race, at least at the grand scheme of where Haro's at, I would love to do one. But yeah. one where I open up my own fold and do it Haro's way, like you said, it's 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 not worth it. Yeah. It's not worth it, you know, it really isn't, you know. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing that they did it and pulled it off, and I think there is some benefit. There definitely is some benefits to it. There's, there's a bike behind me that's got carbon rims, and it's not a BMX bike, and I see some benefits where it would help BMX. Yeah. But at the expense of it, you're right. There's no way, and especially at street or park riding. Like, imagine Dennis boosting a fucking nine-foot quarter and hanging up on a carbon rim. Yeah, I don't know, man. I've heard that, like, uh, Felix rode one for a lot of that crazy video that came out, and he's been riding, like, the same rims for a long time. And and that's one that, like, that one's real impressive to me, just because I see what they do on mountain bikes. I see how long they last there. Maybe the E5 one's designed that much better, and it it really could be, because Dave over there is, is, Dave Patterson over there is extremely smart, so it really could be at that level. Yeah. Um, But, like I said, I mean, I just see... There's carbon wise there's still some areas to go you know you scratch carbon it's an issue okay. yeah street riders rims there's gouges in the sidewalls yep you know that that scares me a little but and like ratty maddie who did the test for rbmx i know him and i bullshitted with him about it and he loves him for the way he rides that's the rim he should have yeah yeah so, it's it's crazy too because uh alienation actually has made carbon yeah. they made them before eclat even did yeah and I haven't ridden them, but through talking to people and like seeing that Matt Copeland's been riding carbon rims for like before BMX freestyle even had them and it's like fine with it, seeing the other people who are riding them, I'm like, man, maybe I should try this. I would say, I mean, if they can help you out so you don't have no bank account, then I would say try it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's... It's worth trying it, you know? I mean, it definitely is. It's the same thing, like, I think the tubeless tire, the, the tubeless tire can, is something that could possibly happen too you know as that technology gets better you know? yeah they've had Especially, that forever yeah you know i could see that really working in street riding you know um there is some downfalls on it but you know you in street riding with us ro- running 30 ps some people are riding 30 psi right now you yep. know so i would say 30 to 40 is pretty standard for lots of street riding and i've seen people get pinch flats left and right that saves pinch flats i mean you don't you don't pinch on that. You rip your tire before you pinch. Yeah. So I, I could see a place for that. I don't think it's going to be in the next, you know, maybe. I think that's one alienation played around with as well. They still, I, think, I mean, all of their rims are tubeless rims. Yeah, you don't have to do a lot. Like if you look up tubeless, if you YouTube tubeless conversion, it's pretty damn. There's so many different ways of doing it to make it work with some Gorilla Glue tape. It's pretty amazing. But, yeah. You know. And I mean, I don't blame them. It, I think that's a smart road for people to start testing product and stuff like that. And it's something that, you know, I'm looking at and I'm gonna look at more. Not saying I'm gonna do it, but I'm gonna at least try a try a set try yeah. and see. You know, we have to. I always commend companies like Epa, Odyssey. You know, who year after year, they're pushing the standards. Mm-hmm. You know, like the elementary step, design wise, from a design standpoint. That's a very good thought out design. Yeah. From a look standpoint, it's one of the ugliest things I've ever seen personally. But <laughs> I had one. Yeah. That, see, it's a personal. I, I never had one, but I knew tons of people that did. You know? It was and, a pain uh, in the ass to put it on, but I I loved that thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It just was, it was a pain because it was hard to do everything at once. Yeah. yeah. I remember, like, I was riding with Casey Badgers once when he had it and his shit slipped, and he's like, ah, this thing never slips, but once it does, it's just a pain. And I'm like, what, really? You know? Yep. But yeah, no, but I think it's important for companies to push those boundaries, and that's why, you know, I'll always try to do it as much as I can. Yeah. So I, I had a maybe a good ending question. 
how how many things don't make the cut how many ideas do you draw up or you know that just never see the light of day if we were in my office i would go like this through my notepad oh i've got there's three fiend frames up there that <laughs> never that never got made um i have a lot of versions of stuff oh like yeah bikes back there that never got made my dentist frame is a little different than other people's frames it more so my geometry so it was going to be an alternative extra long size mm. but it's like i mean i don't not that many people ride 21 and a quarter you know, right or, and a long rear end you know not many people want to vote um but i would say for every 10 products there's at least one you know but it, it depends on at what level if you're talking at a sketch level man it's uh, i would say one out of every three sketch at a sketch or the start of something one out of every three doesn't get made that seems like a high percentage of things that do though yeah it's fairly high i mean you start getting to the point you know like i have a really long like <laughs> so not bmx but i have a very long spreadsheet mm -hmm. and on there is probably a hundred items 50 of them marked in red those 50 are not priorities and probably will never get made oh yeah but they're little thought bubbles that will lead to something else the other 50 are priorities in, yeah. in order of how they should go so you know i always have to you know at any company you're always running it how much profit can i get out so i can have more budget next year right mm -hmm. nobody wants to go talk to the owner and be like oh shit my riders aren't getting an extra trip next year. I can't make an extra pair of grips because I overspent or I didn't deliver. So for me, it's very important. That's why it is such a high level of only one out of every three am I kind of burning. Yeah. Because I want to make sure at the end of the day that the riders that I'm friends with and the riders that I choose to be involved with, they get the best out of me and the best out of the company that they're with. And lots of times that does it's not just the owner's job. Lots of times it, it relies on the team manager, the product guy, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's times where Joey Cobb's our team manager, you know, he yelled at me a year ago about race shit. Like, dude, shit's getting old, dude. You said you're going to redo it. Like, I think it's time, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, this motherfucker, like, I'm really trying to do this right now. Or like, but I'm, then I'm saying, I'm like, he's right. Screw yeah. It. Shut the office door. I'm done for two weeks. I'm doing race stuff heavy for two, you know? Yeah. So it, it does, you know, you just have to focus it. And in that list, you know, riders help you whittle it down a lot too. Like, you know, um, one thing I do a lot of times, like uh, Paris, for instance, now that she's on Haro, she'll get um, the, she'll have a full custom frame, uh, talking about different tires with her, grips, you know. She's awesome. kind of an open book, so I would, uh, to whatever she wants, really. And uh, so with her, same with lots of riders, there's constantly like five projects going on. Yeah. Know? So it's like I always have some going on that will see the light of the tunnel, but some of her, some of her or other people's ideas might not. You know, like mm -hmm. there's a there's a pair of forks in my office that are I did them when I first started for premium, and I'm not making them. Yeah, I'm gonna make them, but it's gonna be a lightweight race fork with <laughs> this new technology in it rather than a street fork. Nice. So you know, it's I burn the idea, but the idea is still a small piece that idea will live on so yeah I'd, I'd say one out of every three that's that's cool insight that's really cool insight i'm sure you've gotten like selective with what ideas you even take past the just oh that's an idea in my head stage oh yeah like that well the other idea i wanted to make a seat with a whoopee cushion in it <laughs> i text brian and told him i need to make a new quest seat with a whoopee cushion in it and his his response back was okay now i know you're too far out there you know and just started laughing so it's like you're you know but hey at the end of the day if i found a way to make that in my office for him it'd be entertaining so, yeah but you know yeah you do have those ideas like i've had you know i i not to say his name and repeat but i've had colin berniak tell me some ideas before where i'm like you're fucking right but you're so far off that it, you're not right you know where i'm like mm -hmm. that is you're right it could go that route, but that route wouldn't work. Yeah. You know, which is which is why you need riders like that. Like, you know, I remember I wanna say it was when had to have been 
it had to have been about 10 years ago, Colin asked me to make him 155 cranks. And this was when 170 was like the length. Yeah. You don't make shorter. And I'm just like, you're crazy. You're absolutely nuts. Yeah. And he stood there in my, at the time I was working out in my bedroom and he's like, put your feet far apart, jump. Now put them close together and jump. Which one felt more natural and did you jump higher? And I'm like, this motherfucker, okay, I gotta pay to get this crank made in 155 just for him to see if this works. So you do need those, you need those harebrained ideas and you need those riders that are gonna push you to the point you're annoyed. Yep, and I'll tell you right now, you saying that is gonna have people commenting saying, where can I get 155 cranks? Well, <laughs> I don't know. That's a tough one. I'm not making 155, but 160, I think, is kind of the street riding that I feel, not for me, but from what I've seen with the riders I'm involved with, 160, 165 is really kind of where you're at. That's so funny because I just, with my most recent bike that I built last year, went to 170 from 175. And I only did that because of a miscommunication and me ending up with 170s. So it was it's like... No, because remember, we don't pedal BMX bikes. Or, well, we do if it's a race bike, but we're not doing gate starts. Yeah, well, I ride trails, so... Well, there you go. There's... Sort of there a little bit. There's a little, like a little bit, but I think the 28.9 part of it, like, makes a five millimeter difference negligible that's probably very true but there's a yeah if you read up other areas of the industry the short crank things like i think everyone's going shorter but yeah i don't know if we'll ever see 155 in the grand production of things i want to say if, if you want 155 cranks i was Colin rides for fiend those were fiend cranks i if they don't make 155s they definitely make 160s yeah i think I, a lot of people make 160s now i, I know premium hasn't come in a month and a lot of people do but for 155s, I would say try Fiend because that was them, so they might even have it. I, yeah, I just had somebody commenting the other day about how they ride 145s and that's all they want to ride. And they're riding, and maybe it, it might not be 145, but whatever the cult yeah. kids' cranks are, they ride those on their adult. 145, yeah, 135 to 145 makes sense. Those, like, I remember I used to. Uh, Sean McCanny when he was little shitty Sean. Yeah, I used to drill out power bike cranks and we tap them for him like uh, through at Epic used to do for Max like I'd make him 135 cranks all the time. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Somebody somebody was commenting saying that those are the only cranks that they won't ride anymore. I'm like, right. Okay. It's nuts to me to think when I was 13 my first pair of three piece cranks were redline three piece cranks. They're 185. Racing. Racing on a, yeah, on a forty on a forty six sixteen. It's pretty nuts. Yeah. I, I started on one seventy fives. I started riding in two thousand six. Rode them until twenty twenty one. I mean I'm like you, I still I still ride one seventies and I also have a really I also have almost a thirteen almost a fourteen inch rear end. Okay. So that I was like I'm six three though and I like riding skate parks, you know, so and bowls, so it makes more sense. That is something, though, that I will say is lacking in BMX. There is a very, a hole in the market between 13.5 and 14 rear end length, where there's yeah, not that, very many that's, options. That's what I was thinking with the frame that I said I have that would not make me, because I was like, oh, maybe like, you know, Dennis rides parks, maybe we'll do an extra long option or something. But now I'm thinking I'm going to save it for something that's not rider specific, because mm -hmm. I've always... I've always really believed, and it's something that other people that have worked with other pros and other uh, bosses have distilled in me, is that if it's got a rider's signature on it, that rider better fucking love that product. They it, better it, not even question it when they put it on their bike. They better not ever look at it and get tired of it, you know? So that was another reason why I didn't want to make a, a, a length of a dentist frame that he didn't ride, because I'm like, that's not true to nature. Yeah, that's yeah, it's, I, I don't like that at all. I don't like the the when you see a part where it's like the rider was handed that part and told that that was their like yep. signature thing it's like that's not the way it should yeah. be it I should be theirs artwork wise it's like you put the art put the artist through the patience yeah it's that artist to do the work it's your it's your product you know if you don't yep. like it it's not right i wholeheartedly agree with that and i'm psyched to hear that and honestly this has been a really good chat just hearing yeah, yeah, about yeah. haro in general too because 
I think Haro is one of those brands, like you said, your paycheck comes from kids, aluminum bikes or whatever. Like, I think people don't know the extent of this stuff when Haro comes up. Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's a weird one because I always say, like, you know, if you look at it as a from a retrospective thing or like a branding mindset, you're like, well, what what is it? You know, and it's like, I look at Haro, it's, it's kind of the balancing point, right? between the mass market and core. Mm -hmm. I sell stuff to the mass market, but I sell stuff to the core at the same time. And it's, dude, that's always the biggest struggle at a company that size is, you know, how do I make sure I do good diligence for BMX? I always respect BMX while still being able to make sure little Johnny can grow, buy a Haro when he's five years old. And when he's 45 years old, he can go buy one of the lineage Haro's that John Baldwin's built because that was the bike he couldn't afford when he was 11. Yep. You know, and it, it, it's really a full cycle, so it's kind of cool to see, you know? It's it's different than other just super core brands for sure, but it does definitely have its core aspects. I mean, there's two grind benches. There's the premium, the premium benches outside and some other stuff's outside, and it's like, you know, people there do ride, you know? It is, it is a bunch of bike riders. You know, if you go to our our R&D build area, there's not a minute somebody isn't, that should be at their desk, isn't down there working on their bike, you know? Yeah, So that's awesome. In California, I tell anybody, you know, we have a company store now, so I tell anybody, just come by, you know? Oh, that's sick. Tell them you know Chad or something, they'll give you a discount. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, if, if you're ever out in San Diego and you want to come by, come by, you know? Yeah, I would. We'll go to the brewery and have lunch afterwards. Yeah, um, I'd love to do yeah, that. You know? So I tell anybody, stop by. It's it's pretty much an open door, you know. Our store is right there, and the warehouse is right there. You that's the store, and you see the bike. That's super sick. I don't know when I'll make it back to California, and it with its current state of things in California. <laughs> it's nuts here right now, man. But I'm sure I'll be back there at some point. Come visit. I'll probably be out that way eventually before too long, anyway. If you come to Rays, hit me up. I need to come to Rays. It's been a while. Get. It's probably been, it's been since I've been back in California, it's been 10 years. Dude, get Chad and Dennis at Rays and make a video of Rays with those two. Oh my Chad God. That would be hilarious at Rays because he would he would know what to do, but wouldn't know what to do. Because he can ride those, he can ride all those jump lines, but Dennis would destroy the place. Well, then there's the, the bowl or the, that's the, true. That exists too. The grind room is, yep. it's, it's the grind room. But then yeah. there's the, the Paul's boutique room, which is, super tight and like Dennis would go crazy in there and then Haro makes mountain bikes so yep. boom throw them on a mountain bike send them on the cross country trail if you I don't know if you saw the Instagram post but they took uh, Christian Regal took Chad and Dennis mountain bike Dennis oh has a Haro mountain bike I think Chad might have one now too but Dennis I, Dennis doesn't go all the time but it Chad posted on his Instagram I was fucking dying because he hits this 40 footer and it's just Ooh, yeah, boy. <laughs> it's like it just like reminded me of being a little kid again. I'm like, dude, he's so just stoked just to jump a big long double again. You know? That's BMX. Yeah, that is like is, the heart of BMX. He might be on a mountain bike, but he's jumping a BMX bike. You yeah, know? it's that it's BMX. So. It's too bad he didn't start his YouTube channel before that. Right. Well, there's an idea too. Yeah, maybe I yeah, I should send him because he I don't know if you watch any of his, but he uses uh that dude Andrew Knight, Elevated Perspectives. Oh, okay. He uses his him to help film all of this. So it's kinda cool because Chad's not you know, he knows he's not a filmer. So right. Andrew's just a homie that follows him around and you know, I wouldn't say follows him around, but he's the homie hanging out with him all the time, so he films it and puts it together. So they're kinda entertaining in that sense, they're a little different. Yeah, that's really rad. But, Maybe I'll have to give them like two absurd mountain bikes to go ride one day. Two e mountain bikes or something <laughs> that they don't even know what they are. <laughs> oh my god! Don't even like make it a surprise. <laughs> yeah, I should give it. have them show up to Haro one day. We got I, something I, for I, you. I do that all the time. Come up for lunch. You know, I should do that one day. <laughs> oh gosh, I would love to see that. Who? That being said, man, we did two hours. Yep. I can talk. I told you that. I I love it though. I mean, my wife's been in, my wife's been home for about an hour, so that means I might have I didn't miss dinner because she's a sweetheart, so she would have waited for me. But I should probably go have a beer and, and dinner at some point tonight. Yes, we'll let you go be a good but husband. If, uh, you, if you ever want to do it again, even if it's with other people or whatever, just let me know. 
yeah i'm i'm way down when yep. when the ideas pop up or just to chat about whatever like even talking about photography stuff i've Absolutely. i've done stuff with people with video but I never photo stuff so it could be cool doing that yeah, kind of man. thing we can talk about that too hell yes well thank you for the insight i think that we're gonna teach a lot of people and like help them understand why things are the way they are right now well thanks for doing what you do it's good to see somebody motivated doing positive stuff in a good light hey i'm doing my best there you go that's all we can all do right that's right (laughs) so that being said where can people find you and examples of what you you, the types of things you work Uh, on I don't know. I'm kind of a, I don't put a lot of my life on social media. Um, but if you go to my Instagram, just at Kevin Connors Yep. and really anything, you know, um, some of the Joey shoots photos for Harlow as well. So some of their Instagrams, mine and his, um, but I would say premium wise, you're going to, you know, see tons of new product, all the new Haro products starting to trickle in. So really anything that Haro or premium puts out is going to be my work as far as that's concerned. Yeah. Photifies, most of it's going to be Instagram, premium, Haro, cinema, Fiend, you know, all that sort of good stuff. So it'll be all over the place. Hell yeah. And uh, if I'm lucky, I'll be talking about some of it here. There you go. <laughs> Hopefully so. Yeah. Good. So that being said, thanks to everyone for tuning in and we yeah, will see you guys for listening to me ramble for two hours. Yes. We'll see Good. you at 10 a.m. Eastern tomorrow morning for the news. Good right, night. There you go. Thank you, Brent. Appreciate it, boss. We're out.